idioma en italki. Empieza hoy en tres simples pasos. Primero, elige para cualquier idioma. Segundo, escoge un profesor. Con Italki puedes escoger entre miles de profesores con experiencia de todo el mundo. Tercero, elige el horario de tu lección. Las clases de idiomas online son el mejor método para aprender con profesores nativos. Con Italki tendrás un profesor de idiomas personal y conversaciones reales con hablantes nativos. Cada día miles de personas aprenden con profesores internacionales a través de Italki. Encuentra un profesor hoy y domina el idioma de tu lección. Hi everyone, this is Anay. Teach Spanish .com. And today we will be talking about three grammar rules to follow when you start learning Spanish. The first one is that as you have already heard, Spanish verbs are always conjugated. That means that they have to match with the subject of the sentence. For example, there are different pronouns in Spanish. Yo, tú, él, ella, usted, nosotros, nosotras, vosotros, vosotras, and ellos, ellas, y usted. All these pronouns have their own conjugations, and it's very common for beginners. So remember this. When you start to conjugate the verbs, they have to work. It's very important as well. The Spanish nouns and adjectives has to be in the same level. Let me explain you this. If you have a noun that is feminine and plural, for example, las mujeres, the adjective that you have to use right after has to be as well. For example, las mujeres españolas. It is the same with the articles las, female and plural. We use this article because, as I say, it's female and plural. The third rule I already mentioned before, and be careful, English speakers, because the adjectives in Spanish go after the noun, not before like in English. This is very common for uh, students that learn Spanish and already speak or know English. When I say it, las mujeres españolas, españolas is the adjective, and I put it after las mujeres. In English, it would be a Spanish woman, but not in Spanish. Okay, there are some occasions where the adjectives go before the nouns. That is true, but normally this use comes out at intermediate level or advanced level. So don't worry when you are a beginner. Thanks for watching the video. Take a lesson with me on italki.com clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today I will be talking about seven Spanish words that are similar to the English Counterpart. These words are also known as cognates. What a cognate is? A cognate is the same linguistic variation that another word and it looks similar and when you pronounce it, it sounds almost the same. And here I give you in cognates so you can use them. The first one is alcohol in Spanish. Guess you know what it means because it sounds pretty similar than in English, doesn't it? Number two is conclusión. This one has a different pronunciation in Spanish, but you will understand definitely when you start learning Spanish. Number three, three, <laughs> hobby. This one is completely similar. We basically... Number four, individual. The next one, number five, finishing. Yes, we use this word with the same pronunciation and meaning. Next one, number six, is informal. I like to use this one in my lessons to explain ways to greet and say goodbye because it's similar and is a word to understand very quickly. And the last 
are some words related to sports. If you're learning Spanish and you like sports, you're lucky because most of the words are cognates. Football, tennis, baseball, volleyball, hockey, water polo, golf, surf, and almost all sports are cognates. So, talking about your there are many, and I would like to remember you that there are hundreds of cognates, and if you check them, you can be ready to your first Spanish watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the iTalki YouTube channel for more tips on Spanish. Take a lesson with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hasta luego! Hi everyone, it's Caroline here and I teach English on italki. Today I am going to be talking about business idioms or idioms you might hear in your office or in your workplace. A student asked me a really good question the other day. He asked me whether, because I'm an, a native English speaker, do I know every single idiom? And the answer is no. Idioms are phrases or expressions that come from a particular place or a particular age group. So idioms are different than the idioms in the United States. I have chosen five business idioms to talk to you about today, and you may hear them. So hopefully they will be super useful for you. Idiom number one is the big picture. Imagine you go into a meeting and your boss says to you, we've lost sight of the big picture. What does that mean? That means that you are thinking too much about the small details of the project and you are so interested in those little details that you don't remember what it is you're trying to achieve. So always keep sight of the big picture. The second idiom is to go the extra mile. Now imagine you're in an interview and the interviewer says to you that they are looking for someone who always goes the extra mile. What does that mean? Does it mean they want you to run around the office every day? No, it means they want more than just what is in the job description. They want to go that little bit further and to take on extra responsibility. That is going the extra mile. The third idiom is a win-win situation. A win-win situation means everybody... A really good example of this is these videos that I'm making for italki. Italki gains some content for their website, some lessons for their learners, and I have a platform where students can see me and book lessons with me. It's a win-win. Italki wins? The fourth idiom is word of mouth. So an example of this is think about how you found out about italki. Did you find italki by searching on Google or did you find italki your friends recommended it to you? Recommendations from friends are word of mouth. It can be positive or it can be negative. If your company gets bad word of mouth, it is going to be a very difficult time for your company because people really listen to the opinions of their friends. good word of mouth about it. The fifth and final business idiom is to touch base. My manager used to say this to me a lot. 
space means to have a very quick and short meeting about a project or something that you are working on. It might only be five minutes of your time, but in that time, you will check that your understanding of the project is the same as your manager's understanding of the project. So I have a chat. Good morning. I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Okay, all good. Lovely. Um, I just wanted to say good morning. Uh, welcome to the session this morning. Welcome to Johannesburg. Nice cold Johannesburg outside. Sunny, of course, um, but really cold. We had a massive thunderstorm last night, so everything's wet uh, outside. Um, but that's and it's unusual for this time of year. But do let me know in the comments. Um, uh, which country you're from and uh, yeah, which city and what the weather's like in your country. We are going to be looking at the articles today, the articles, um, the, uh, and all those kinds of things, okay? So let's get started. I've done this last session, but I want to do a quick revision so that we can actually just, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we can um, just all be ready. So, okay. So articles are a, uh, an, and the, or none at all, okay? So a uh, or an is used before countable nouns. You can count them, all right? Um, so, something like um, the flowers in the garden is countable, but flour that you measure out for baking is not countable, okay? So you would say a flower, but you would say I got flour or some flour um, in the garden. Hi, Brad or Bray, I don't know how you say it. Which country are you from? Um, and then we, we use a, before consonant sounds, okay? Um, and an before vowel sounds. So a dog, an apple, all right? Vowels are A, E, I, O, U. India, well, well done. Welcome to this lesson. Thank you for joining us from such a far way away. Okay. So a or an mean one or single, all right? So let's go on to the next slide. Um, we've, I've got some examples that I gave you last time. I have an owl as a pet. I'd like a pizza for lunch. I have an urgent need of a hospital. Now, remember, this is a vowel sound and a consonant sound. Um, so a hospital, okay, um, but an hour, an hour. It's going to take an hour because the hour is a is an O sound, hour to get there. Then again, do you have a euro? The y sound is a consonant sound at the beginning of a sentence. Do you have a euro? That's why we say a euro. And then we have an excellent pizza, a beautiful owl, because the adjective is important. So if the adjective starts with a a vowel, we say an. If the adjective starts with a consonant, we say a. So um, that's what that's all about. Now, <clears throat> I also uh, wanted to mention about uncountable nouns. I'm just um, revising, so I'm going quickly, all right? So we have air, love, honesty, advice, science, okay? And then um, things like that. Um, then uh, I just wanted to mention this I haven't done. The and the, it's still T-H-E, but I put it in inverted commas, and a uh, and a. All right. So the is also used like like an before a vowel. So, um, so you can say the apple, the orange, like you say an apple, an orange, you'll say the apple, the orange. Okay, got that? Good. Then you can also use it to emphasize something. 
So you can say, um, uh, good morning, Oscar. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, <clears throat> Cant Cantabria, yep. Uh, it's, I'm sure uh, it's, it's warmer than here um, at the moment. Um, so when you say a, or sorry, the, um, when it's not a vowel, or even when it is a vowel, um, but you say it strongly, it's for emphasis. So, um, uh, so there are several apples on the table, but there's one apple with a bruise on. So which apple has the bruise? Is this the apple? Okay. And that the person will say yes. Okay. So it's always in answer to something else because it's an emphasis. All right. So it's an answer to something else. It's answer to some sort of question because you're emphasizing it. You're not, and you can't emphasize it being the government house in America rather than just a house that happens to be white. So you would say, Camilla, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, the White House. Um, and same with um, A, all right? So a, a, now that's just how you say it. Uh, it's not how you spell it. So again, emphasis. Did you find any coins? Yes, I found a coin, but I'm not sure it's the kind of coins you wanted. It's a Roman coin, okay? Issa, good morning uh, from Zaragoza, Spain. Well, Done, everybody, for getting up this early. Um, yeah. Oh, there. Now we're going to go on to uh, revision again. Um, and please just ask me questions and uh, interact with me. Um, doing some revision of articles this morning and introducing some new things. This particular slide is an uh, revision. So it's definite versus indefinite article, okay? So a or an is non-specific, the is specific. So if you talk about a bicycle, I want a bicycle. A bicycle is non-specific. The blue bicycle is very specific. He's talking about that one over there. A bicycle, any old one, a racing one, a mountain bike one, any old bike, okay? Do you have a driver's license? It could be a driver's license for a tractor or a car or a um, truck, anything like that, any driver's license. But I, once you, <laughs> I have lost the key card to my hotel room. There's only one key card or two, but they've, I've only been given one. So I've lost the keys card to my hotel room or I lost the key card to my hotel room. Could I have another one, please? Okay. All right. So you also, this is revision. You use a uh when talking about something that's new or the other person doesn't know about it or introduced for the first time to a person. And also we use a uh when you're talking about the existence of something. Okay. So I own a house. Nobody knows what kind of house it is. You're just saying that you own a house. Once you've used a, you will then use the or my house from then on, okay? So I own a house. Mary is a doctor. That is a profession. So that is what we do say um, when we're introducing somebody's profession, profession, okay? That's a very important thing. When we're introducing somebody's profession, we always use a, I'm a teacher. Uh, she's a cleaner, he's a gardener, okay? Then the existence of something, is there such a thing, such as a Tagalog dictionary? Okay, all right. And then you, if we become specific, um, we use the. So it's used to talk about something that's already known to the person who's listening to you. Okay, it's been mentioned, it's been introduced, it's been discussed. So listen to the difference in the sentence change here. I have a very big present in my bag. The present is for my mom. Okay, 
Got it? So once you've introduced the idea, immediately you change to the, okay? Then, um, if, you, if you are asking for something in an aisle, you say, do you know where the cheese is? The cheese refers to the cheese aisle and you expect the person you're talking to, to know it. So you say the cheese, okay? Um, because it, you're actually saying the cheese aisle. Same as if you ask for the, the toiletry aisle or the um, toilet paper aisle. So where's the toilet paper? Where's the, where are the um, um, toiletries? Where are, uh, where's the meat, okay? Uh, you mean the meat section. That's why you say the, it's very specific. Okay, we cannot travel to the sun. The sun, there's only one sun in our, um, we know the stars are, are suns, but, and the sun is a star, but, We've only got one uh, close sun, one, one close star, and that is our sun. So we call it the sun, as it is too hot. And then I saw the iguanas in the park yesterday. You are referring to something that someone has said about the iguanas. They, so you'll say, somebody will say to you, I saw two iguanas in the park yesterday. Um, and then you will go, and you'll come back to them and then you say, oh, I saw the iguanas, the iguanas that you were talking about in the park yesterday. Okay. Um, I hope you don't because they're quite dangerous animals, but there you go. Let me know uh, now if there are any questions. How do you use articles in your home language? Do you have articles? Okay. Let me know about that. This is also a revision, so I'm going to go quite quickly through it, okay? Because I don't want to spend too much time on the revision. The is used with uncountable and plural nouns. So you sometimes, with uncountable nouns, you don't use any articles. You may use the with some uncountable and plural nouns, okay? So if it's referring to one group or one kind or one example. So the flowers in that bed, that's very, very specific. It's the group of flowers in that bed um, were given to me my, by my brother-in-law. But I planted flowers. It's not specific. I could, it could be any kind of flower. So I planted flowers in that bed, garden bed, yesterday. Bed refers to uh, a section of um, soil where you plant your, your flowers or your vegetables, okay? Um, then the biology of zebras is fascinating, okay? The biology, zebras is something I'm going to come back to, okay? The biology, because it's talking about um, the zebra's biology, okay? It's very specific, narrowed down, it's one group, okay? I hope that you're with me. Please ask questions if I am not clear, okay? Then, otherwise we say biology is something you study at school because it's a broad subject. We don't use an article, okay? Then, people in Spain eat tapas, that's fine. But the people in Spain eat tapas. Actually, when we're talking about a country, it tends to be a little bit interchangeable. But uh, the brings it down to the modern day uh, and age. It brings it down to this time. Okay. Um, so um, uh, people in Spain is more generalized. It's over centuries. But the people in Spain is more current. But we use it interchangeably. So when you're talking about countries, you can change it. Okay. Good. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> uncountable nouns and generalization. Okay. So here is where, yeah, Camila, we're going to go on here. Uh, okay. I mean, when I'm used, uh, when I'm talking about something, I used to repeat many times because in Spanish we 
use a lot the articles. We use the articles a lot, yeah. Um, yes, I, I am talking about it in this slide here, okay? So we will go on to no articles now, and this is where it's going to be um, a little challenging, so I will slow down, okay? Um, okay, so we use no article when it's a generalization, okay? <laughs> Yes, I agree. You don't want to think about how you speak in your native language. You just want to focus on the other. But um, generally, when you're generalizing, when you're making a statement that's a very broad statement, we use no article with uncountable nouns and plural nouns. Remember, we use the when you're talking about a group or a specific uh, example within that. But no article is when it's more broad, okay? We're talking about uncountable nouns and plural nouns here. So when you use either no article for an uncountable noun, you use no article for a plural noun, unless it's a small group of those, okay? So um, <clears throat> what we've mentioned about flowers, and um, yeah, um, those sorts of things, we use the sometimes, but we use no article when it's uncountable, when it's plural, and it's a generalization. Okay. Um, Sabias, you're asking, uh, what can I do to walk, work on italki? Someone from italki will give you a little uh, sentence about that quickly. Um, yeah, and we'll go back to um, our slide. So advice in our example is uncountable. And by the way, it's really nice working on italki. You get to meet people from all over the world and they are lovely people, okay? So let's go back to the slide now. <laughs> um, it's always best to get advice. Advice is uncountable. It's not specific. It's not specifically given by one person. So it's no article. You wouldn't say a advice. You wouldn't say an advice. No. You can say the advice of my own specific doctor. Yes. Okay. The advice of Dr. Tom. All right. But if you're talking about advice from anyone, it's too general. No article. Okay. Then what would we do without water? Okay. So water is very general. It's non-specific. And we're just asking a question. What would we do without water? But the water, the water in this glass um, is clear and tastes, tastes delicious, okay? So when you're talking about a, a tiny bit of water, something that you can measure, you can and do put the in front of it, okay? Once it's general and it, it is, by the way, it remains an uncountable noun, even if you can put it into milli, millimeters or milliliters. Um, but all we do is change the article. Okay, so we say the water in this glass, but water in general, no article whatsoever. Okay. All right, then no article when it comes to meat. Meat is an uncountable um, uh, 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 noun as of vegetables vegetables also uncountable okay um it's not and vegetables are plural um so because vegetables are just vegetables they're just multitudinous okay um but meat is an uncountable noun it's a general specific it's a general term um so you and you can't measure it um un, until it comes into smaller quantities here you're just saying a general um um, statement, uh, but when you're talking about that little 600 grams of meat, maybe it's gone off and you'll say, the meat's not good anymore, it must be thrown away. And you're talking about that specific meat, 
you would say the, but otherwise talking about meat, um, you, you would say no article. I must go and buy some meat. I must go and buy meat today. Okay. You don't not saying how much you're not referring to a specific thing, no article. And then again, just to reiterate flowers, flowers, plural noun, um, it's general, no spe specificity, <laughs> so no article. Flowers are beautiful. Okay, I hope that was clear. If it was as clear as mud, then please tell me. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Okay, again, I'm coming back to the, we use the, so I've gone from um, uh, the with, gener with uncountable nouns, okay? Um, then I've gone to no article with uncountable nouns and plurals. Now I'm going to the with generalizations, okay? So it's not about uncountable nouns or plurals or anything. This is about a generalization. So when we talk about musical instruments, um, we will say the, the piano, the flute. I will give you an example um, later on, but just let's list the things where we use the first. Plants, the coconut, the rose bush, the baobab tree, okay? The tomato bush, animal, animals, <laughs> the leopard, the elephant, the lion. And I'll show you how it's a generalization and not a specific thing. So it can either, you can either say the leopard or the, um, what, what we were talking about, the um, iguana, the iguana, um, when it's specific or you can be using it as a gen generalization, okay? So that's a bit of a, uh, a conflict in English, but, but you always tell um, the difference by the, by the context, what the other sentences around that sentence are saying. Okay, so the can be used to be either specific or it can be used for a generalization. Sorry, guys, but it does. But only with these specific things that I'm mentioning here, okay? Uh, inventions, the steam train, the wheel, okay? Currencies, the rand, the dollar, the yen, all right? And there's a couple more. I'll give you examples just now. Uh, the next is body parts, the toe, the head, the arm. Now, this is only when we are making generalizations, okay? Not when we're talking about the a specific um, item, so my eye or something like that, okay? But when we're making a, a generalization about eyes, okay? Now, let's give you a, an example. I play the trombone. No, I don't, but <laughs> um, that's an example. I play the piano. I play the flute. So we don't say I play piano. I play the piano. Okay. Uh, and that means any piano in the world. But the piano, it's about the activity that we're doing. Okay. So when we use the in, in this generalized sense, uh, when we're talking about a musical instrument, it's about the activity. Then the baobab, meaning all baobab trees, okay? Um, the baobab as native to Africa. The baobab is native to Africa, okay? Then let's go. Alexander Bell did not invent the telephone. The Italians seem to have a prior claim, although, although that has been disputed, okay? Um, then the rand, which is my currency, or the dollar, or the euro, is very weak at the moment, okay? So you talk about it, any currency as the, the. Not when you're talking about this costs, this um, cleaning stuff costs $20 or $2, okay? Um, or five euro, no. 
that's singular because you, you're being specific about how many. But that's without any article because you've already got a specificity in the number beforehand. Um, five, okay, that makes it specific. But when you're talking about the currency as a whole, as a generalization, um, you're talking about um, the rand, the euro, the dollar, okay? Then specific, not my head, um, but the head, okay? The head generally is vital for the body. I've never seen yet seen a headless person, so there we go. Okay, now we have um, our worksheet, which we did last time, so I'm not going to do go through this. Um, I'm going to go through very quickly. I'm going to go through per and an. Okay. Per can be used as a or an. All right. So my car doesn't go faster than 80 kilometers per hour or 80 kilometers an hour. So here is a or an. You've got the speed interchangeable with per in these senses. Uh, Uber charges 70 rand a person or 7 euro a person, okay? 7 euro per person or 7 euro a person. Uh, the apples cost 2 rand a kilo or 2 euro a kilo, okay? So it's, that's pretty easy and I think that's an easy one to understand. Let's go back. I've also... Uh, mentioned that the expresses rank, first, second, third, or order, um, previous, before, uh, after, etc., like that. Okay, so examples, the next time. So you wouldn't say next time you do that. We say that uh, to be uh, quick, but we actually mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, Camila, I'm going to go back then. Uh, and an, all right, it's pretty easy. Um, a is before a consonant sound and an is before a vowel sound. Okay, so a dog, a cat, and vowels are a, e, i, a, e, i, o, u, okay? Five vowel sounds with combinations that we get, all right? Um, but the consonants are B, C, D, F, G, etc., etc., until Z, and the Y counts as a, a consonant when it becomes when it comes at the beginning of a word. Okay, sometimes the Y counts as a vowel sound, but most of the times um, it counts as a consonant. So now, when we go to a hotel, the H is a consonant sound so we will say a hotel however hour it's they are 60 minutes in an hour um oh yes hour ah is a is a ah sound hour okay hour hour it begins with an h but the sound begins with an ah we leave out the h at the beginning so it's an hour okay um, the same as it would be for an orange. Um, and no, it's not different with time expressions. It's about the sound, not the spelling, the sound. Okay. So a hotel, a hospital, but an hour, hour is a sound, is a vowel sound. Hour is a vowel sound because we don't say the H. Okay. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, I mentioned before that you would say a y euro, okay, because the y is a consonant sound, a euro, but an elephant because the e is a vowel sound. They both start with u, I mean e, they both start with e, but an elephant is a, it's the sound that's important, not the spelling, the sound. 
So an elephant, a euro. Okay, good. Good, I'm glad you got it. Yeah, the sound, what it sounds like. Okay, so um, good. I'm glad you got it. So there we have it. Um, shall we now go back to our slides? By the way, please ask questions, even if it's not about that particular slide. I love interacting with you. Uh, it's fantastic if you ask lots of questions. Um, and it's really good to um, just engage with you and then go back to the slide, okay? I'm going to go quickly through this slide because I have gone through it before. So the expresses rank or order, the next time you do that, you'll get a fine. The first time she danced, the second time she danced, the 10th time she danced, she sprained her ankle, okay? She'd been to the shops on the, the previous day, okay? The previous day, the day before, okay? Um, so she's decided to stay at home. You would also say the following day, the day after, etc., etc. Okay, so that is what the ranking is for and the order. You use the. I also mentioned that you use the with superlatives. He is superlatives are best and most and tallest and anything with an st. That's the superlative adjective. Um, you will use the with, the best dressed, the funniest thing I've ever heard, the most important. <laughs> Good. Camila, that's great. <laughs> the most important advice you will ever receive. Okay. You could ask as many questions you like. Okay. Then, um, with comparatives, you use the or a an, okay? So if you want, here you take the normal rules of English. I'd like to see the bigger pack of lions. I'm talking about a very specific pack of lions, a very specific pride of lions, okay? Then I would like to see a bigger pride of lions, a bigger pack of lions. You're asking about any group, any group of lions, you you just want to see something that's a bit bigger, okay? It's not specific, right? But when you are comparing two things, you use the, okay, always. Between Noah and his wife, two things. Um, I think that he is the wiser one, okay? Comparatives are when you, you say more, not most, better, not best, uh, wiser, not wisest, uh, taller, not tallest. Um, so those are the comparatives. Comparative adjectives when you have are, are uh, at the end of the word in comparing. And then with those, you use the when there's just two. But otherwise, you use the general um, rules for articles, which is the bigger pack um, is very specific about which group you want to see a, a pack, any, any pack of lions, okay? But yeah, you do have to use articles. You can't leave them out. Okay, now, um, we started on this. Um, and we went through the first uh, worksheet. So I'm going to just go through the answers for those of you who weren't here. Um, can you switch the TV up a bit? Okay, because it's about that specific TV. And you all know uh, that that's the TV you're talking about. Okay, um, yeah. So you all know in the house that it's your TV. Um, he charges $2 a bag of oranges, okay, a bag per bag, right? Remember, you can interchange them. He went, his, want, went to visit his sister the following day, okay, the following day because it's um, order. 
I have a blue car and a red one introducing it to my readers. Once I've introduced it, I now say the blue car is in the garage, okay? So immediately I will change to the in the next sentence because you know now that I've got a blue car. So it becomes the. That's the 20th time I've told you. It's again rank. So it um, uses the. Uh, then superlatives number six. David was the most handsome man, the most handsome man Sally had ever met. Okay, so because it's emphasis, I said the, did you hear that? David was the most handsome man Sally had ever met. There's a real emphasis there. So that's why it becomes the. Right, now, okay. Now I'm going to go to this and I'd like you to um, engage with me now. Please do number seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then I will pick up as you're going along. As you are ready, I will um, please write the answer. Seven, a, uh, the, an, uh, no article, just cross it out, okay? Um, it was hmm, best day of my life. Number eight, she is hmm, more, not most, Beautiful of the two. Right. Mm, good advice is what we need right now. Number 10. Mm, love is in mm, air. Okay. I want mm, bigger car. Number 12, with the age of the internet, hmm, information is at our fingertips. So do fill in the adjective, uh, number seven, correct, whichever one it is. It was the best day of my life. Let's see if you can get it. Ah, I see. Hi, Mayita from Lima. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, the wrong one. No, okay. I'm looking on the italki ch chat. Okay, Issa, number seven. It was the best day of my life. Yes, superlative, the. Number eight, she is the more beautiful of the two comparing to the correct. Uh, number eight, good advice is what we need right now. No, uh, never a uh, with uncountable nouns. Advice is uncountable, so we never use a uh or an with un uncountable nouns. We sometimes use the, but generally we use, if we're talking non-specific generalization, we use no, no, no uh, articles. Okay. Uh, number 10, love is in the air. That's correct. N no article before love, because you're talking very generally, but the air, um, is more symbolic, it's more abstract, and I'll come to that, and it's more specific about this air, okay? All right. Um, then I want a bigger car, that's number 11, because you're talking about, you. okay, you, you can actually use the, okay. If you are comparing um, the, the um, two cars in the shop, you can say the bigger car, but you have to be comparing two. Otherwise, if if you're just talking about, look, I've got a small car, I want a bigger car, it doesn't matter which car, I just want a bigger car, then you would say a. Non-specific. 
and it's a comparative. So bigger, you don't have to use the. Remember, the is specific, a is general, and uncountable is even more general, okay? And plural. Um, with the age of the internet, okay, no. Um, uh, number nine is just as it stands, no article before. We'll actually start the sentence with G, capital G. Good advice is what we re need right now, okay? Good advice is what we need right now. Okay, so with number 12, with the age of the internet, um, uh, information, uncountable noun, okay, is at our fingertips, okay? Um, if you're talking about specific information, informa um, information about uh, treatment of the coronavirus, you would say the information is on that website. The information about treatment of the coronavirus, about the treatment of the coronavirus is on that website. Then you would use that. But otherwise, you use nothing, okay? Uncountable nouns. I'm going to go through number 11, yeah, okay? So uncountable nouns, number 12, information, you do not use an article, okay? You do not use an article, okay? You do not use an article with an uncountable noun unless you are being very specific when you would use the, never a, never an, okay? Number 11, okay, I want a bigger car, okay. It's a very general statement. You're not talking about that car. So you would use a, okay. Only when you're talking about that car, that one over there, um, can you say a, the bigger car, okay. So, um, Braj, I'm not sure how to say your name. Is it Braj, maybe? Uh, a, um, which one are you referring to? Seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not quite sure. Um, so number 11, I want a bigger car because you're talking about any car. The has to be specific and only when you're talking about comparing two things. Remember, bigger is a comparative. Ah, good. Well done. Thank you, Brad. Um, bigger is a comparison. So you want to use um, either a or the, but the you will only use when you are comparing two things. Okay? Is that clear? All right, or when you're talking about a specific group of lions. Okay, so I want a bigger car. I want a bigger car. All right. Um, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Thanks, Issa. I, I do realize that um, it can sometimes go either way. All right. So um, you're right, you were talking about something specific, you were absolutely right to use the, in that uh, sense, okay. So number 11 is, I want a bigger car. I want a bigger car, okay, because it's any car. If you want to say, I want, there are two cars I want the bigger car, that is correct as well, okay? But you must be talking about two, a choice between two. Good, these are excellent articles. Um, I mean, questions, sorry. <laughs> Just remember number 12, with the age of the inf internet, information is an uncountable noun. You cannot count out information, is at our fingertips. Only when it is very specific do you use the, okay? And then you would be saying the information because it begins with a vowel, the information, the information, okay? I'm going to take a slight breather there, let you just gather your thoughts.
Okay. Now we are going to talk about something that is a little different, okay? So this is a different rule. This is a completely different rule. When we talk about going to the pub, the supermarket, the toilet, the doctor, the cinema, the park, we use the. Why is that? It's because of the activity. It's when, when, we, um, when we talk about going to the pub, we are not talking about a place, okay? We're talking about going to drink probably alcohol, maybe a, a, a lemon, a lime and soda. When we talk about the supermarket, we actually talk about going, we're actually meaning we're going grocery shopping, okay? When we talk about the toilet, obviously we're going to the toilet. When we talk about the doctor, we're going to see him about a medical problem we have and he's going to treat us. That's talking about the activity, not the place, not the person, okay? I'm going to the cinema. I'm actually going to see a movie, okay? I'm going to the park. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going for a picnic. I'm going to enjoy the open air, all right? We use that. With these specific words, um, can't th there may be some other words that I haven't included, but these are ones that we definitely use the in front of, okay? So he went to the toilet, not a toilet, okay? It's always got to be the toilet. It's got to be, he went to the toilet because you're talking about an activity, not a place. I'm going to the supermarket. I'm going shopping, okay? Versus... I'm going to a supermarket. Okay, what are you going to do there? Are you going to apply for a job? Are you going to, um, what are you going to do? Why are you going to a supermarket? Okay, but I'm going to the supermarket. I'm going shopping. Everyone understands. So when, if you, if you were to say, um, I'm going to a supermarket, you need to say what you're going to do there. Okay, because otherwise people will look at you and think, why? Yeah, so what? Okay, so the talks about shopping uh, for groceries. Um, I'm going to the pub. I'm going to go drinking with my friends or whatever. But I don't know which one. Okay, so I'm going to the pub. So in other words, I'm going to go drinking. But I don't know which one. That's fine. It's not about specificity here. It's not about being specific. It's about drinking, okay? The activity. I'm going to the pub, but I don't know which one, okay? You can say, I'm going to a pub, but I don't know which one. But you could, um, that could be for applying for a job. It could be because you're going to go and clean it. It could be because you're going to, um, I don't know, uh, see how many people you can count in the pub, <laughs> in that particular pub. Who knows? You're going to conduct a survey. Who knows what you're going to do at the pub, okay, at that particular pub. But I'm going to a pub, but I don't know which one, all right? So you might say, I'm going to a pub, and I'm going to meet my friend there, and we're going to have a meal, um, but I don't know which one. That's fine, okay? But if you're, I'm going to the pub, means I'm, I'm drinking. Good. Um, let's go on to the next section. Okay, now <laughs> we're going to do something totally different. It's totally opposite, okay? So with uncountable nouns, like church and school, again, you don't use the, but you're talking about the activity, okay? So those ones I mentioned, you're talking about the activity, but you the previous slide, but you uh, use the. With uncountable nouns, such as church or school, you can have, it's kind of, in this sense, church is uncountable, okay? So you can have six churches, yes. You can have six schools, yes. But in this sense, church is uncountable because it's talking about an activity, okay? So I'll just explain the difference. Let me take a break, just to give you time to catch up. Okay, he's going to church. 
Okay, he's going to, um, uh, you know, engage in the religious service there. Okay, so he's going to be actively doing something there. That's what he's doing. He's doing uh, the religious service. Okay, but she's going to a church and what? Are you going to apply for a job? Are you going to clean it? Are you going to look at the windows? Are you going to... They're going to do all the activities that they're doing at school. They're going to learn. They're going to uh, have the teacher teach them. Just wait. Okay. School. They're going to school. That's what they're doing. That's the activity. The school kids are going to school. Okay. The school kids are going to learn at school. So they're going to school. They're going to practice school. Okay. Issa, I'm trying to, I'll, I'll come to that. Then we as parents, we're going to a school and um, any school. We're going to a school and we're going to ask them if we can use their football pitch, okay? So that's any school, okay? When you're talking about something that's not activity related so school and the learning are associated together all right church and the the service are associated together that's an activity that you do there that's an activity that you do at the place but the place isn't important so do not use the article when you use church school football when you are talking about the activity that people will do there, he's going to church, he's going to worship, all those kinds of things. They're going to school, they're going to learn, and the teacher will teach them. He's going to football, he's going to practice football. Okay. So never use a, any article like a, the, an when you're talking about an activity we use <laughs> we use the um the word church to describe an activity not to describe a place sometimes okay we use the word school to describe what we do there not to describe the place sometimes we use the word football when we talk about doing an activity not to describe the place. Okay, so when you're talking about the activity and what you usually do there, you, 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 you don't use an article with these specific words, okay? However, you can say the school, so my son's school is um, um, small, the school is small, okay? So when you're talking about a building, Yes, the is used when it's a place. Yeah, the is used, the or a is used when it's a place. And then your normal article usage applies. So when it's an activity, no article in this for these particular um, words. When it's a place, you'd use the or a. I hope that understand, I hope you understand that. So I'll come to football just now. We are going to a school means a place. The school means a place. But uh, they're going to school means an activity. Okay. I hope that's clearer. Yes, the school is closed during lockdown. Perfect. You can also say school, schooling, uh, school is closed during lockdown because you're talking about the activity. But this, that specific school, Round the corner uh, is closed during lockdown. Well done. Excellent, Camila. Okay. When it comes to football, football is when you engaging in the football, you are doing, I'd go to school every Monday. Yes. Without the article, you are absolutely right. You've got it. You've got it. Um, because you are going to learn. Good. Um, he will go to football today. He will go to practice and run and kick the ball, football. That's the activity, okay? 
but they will go to the football match in the stadium on Saturday. That's the place. So football can also describe a place, okay? Um, and that is when you will say the football, the football. We actually mean the football match in the stadium there, but we shorten it because we're English and we're lazy and um, we, we say the football. Uh, if you want to use a, you can also do that. I'm going to a football match. I don't know the place. I don't know where. Um, I don't know what time. It's just a. Okay. Good. I hope that's a little bit clearer. Okay. I'll give you a break. I'm going to do a worksheet next time. And I think I made, um, I'm doing pronunciation this week. I'm just going to double check what I'm going to do, but I will rework this because there's a lot more to articles. Okay. I'm going to give you a breather and then talk about a couple of other things. So some names require an article. So you will have heard this, the USA, I'm going to the USA or I'm going to the States. Okay, because it's a very specific thing. Um, states, you can be used anywhere in the world. So you want to make it very specific and the states. Okay, same as kingdom. Kingdom can be used anywhere in the world. So when it's the United Kingdom, the UK, you want to be specific about what you're talking about. Okay, the United Kingdom, Britain, the USA, the states. Then you would say the Science Museum in Kensington, okay? So you would say that it's the Science Museum. I'm going to the Science Museum today, and it's a specific. Mm. Um, okay, the Science Museum, okay? But I can go to any uh, Science Museum in any country in the world. But if you're talking about the Science Museum down the road, in Kensington or in wherever it is, then you then you are use that. Okay, it's the name of the museum. Uh, Camila, you've said something. Yeah, then for you this topic, I, I'm not sure I understand. Sometimes seems less important, but it actually does help you a lot in your English. Um, if you want to sound natural, you use the, the, this is high level, by the way, uh, then you use the in order to get yourself to a high level. Okay. I've come to more or less the end. Okay. Uh, so I won't go through this because I think um, it, we can't go through it quickly enough. So I'll just leave it there. And any questions, uh, write them down and bring them next time. I think I'll probably do it on Monday, uh, the next um, thing about articles. I'll double check and you'll see it on the schedule on the italki website. Uh, so it's been great engaging with you today. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope that if you want to book a lesson, you just go to italki.com forward slash teacher forward slash five triple six nine zero eight, which is my number. And you can book a lesson with me. Um, but yeah, otherwise I'll see you. I think it is on Monday. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Great. Isa. I'm so glad you learned a lot. Take care. Bye-bye then. your lessons so far. This could be five minutes at the end of the lesson where you review all of the different subjects that you have been studying, your touching base about the things you have covered so far. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to italki by clicking somewhere <laughs> and you can take a lesson with me by clicking on my teacher profile in the description box. Have a good day everyone, bye. Welcome back to the Stop Being Boring When Speaking English video series. When speaking to native English speakers, it's useful to use a variety of vocabulary to make your conversation sound more interesting and flow.
Why not spice up your language a little bit and impress others with your speaking abilities? In this next video, we will take a look at some American and British slang. Number one, American. John Hancock. John Hancock. Mm -hmm. So that's a person. It's a name of a person, yes. And it's American slang. Mm -hmm. What do you think of me? Um, I just got John Hancock. Does it mean that wasted? Certainly not. Give, give me an example. Okay. So, can I please have your John Hancock at the bottom of this paper? Come on, you gotta get it out. Is it your signature? Yes! You got it! That was easy! Okay, awesome. Number one, British. Peak. What does peak mean? Like, uh, taking a peak. Yeah, that's, that's, Sorry, that's not taking a peak. That, that's not smack. This is taking a peak. Well, that's just like taking a peak, that sort of slang. Oh. Like in a slang like peak. Like the peak of a mountain? That's not slang, that's actually yeah, a Yeah, that is the peak of a mountain. I don't know, tell me. Okay, let me give you an example. So, say you go out, you go out one night, and you lose your purse, your keys, Is it like the most horrible situation you can be in? Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, that's so peak. You'd be like, oh, so, yeah. How was your night? It was so peak. I just got fired. That's so peak. Exactly. So it's like the peak of badness, I guess. Oh my god. Yeah, okay. So the peak. Two, American. Jacked. Jacked. Does, Jacked. That, does that mean like hench? What does hench mean? Like say there's the gym. Don't answer back with the slang word. <laughs> <laughs> so the British equivalent of jacked would be hench, I think. Okay. So if someone's like really ripped. Yes, exactly. Okay. Go to the gym, work out a lot. Like, Whoa, look at him, he's so jacked. We would say hench. Number two, British. Peng. 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 I'm just thinking of peng. Peng. It's similar, I don't know. I guess it's a little similar. Um, no. Give me an example. Uh, okay, so for example, say you're eating a cake. It's delicious. You can say, oh, this is peng. Does it just mean delicious? You could use it in other contact texts as well. Just be like, it hits the spot, you know? Yeah, but I could also say that your eyes are pegged. Oh. Or a person is pegged. Just to be like, extraordinarily awesome? Basically. Oh, like, if, you, yeah. if you're talking about a person, you might even say pegging. Pegging. Like, he's a pegging. Okay. This is mostly love. Like he's like a 10. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, the, like the top of the top. Yeah, basically. Number three, American. I blew it. I blew it. I blew it! What a nightmare! I blew it! Yeah. So that means that you've completely ruined the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Say like, I didn't make it into, didn't make it into school. So my parents will not be proud of me. I blew it. Yeah. When you locked up late to work, don't really ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never late. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, British. Having a mare. Having a mare. Having a mare. A nightmare. Like, horrible, real nightmare. In realistic, in reality, basically. Very good. Okay. That's exactly that it. That's a lot easier than that. Basically. Yeah. Well, I thought I was going you. Having a mare. You were having a mare before. I was having a mare before. Yeah. Not understanding anything she was saying. Yeah, exactly. So there you have it, there's our British and American slang. Tell us what you thought of it. Did you understand it? And we'll see you next time. My name is Vũ Nguyễn. Tên tôi là Vũ Nguyễn. It's really amazing thing for me. From uh, from Ajaxi, I can meet people around the world, and they can give me more energy to live and more inspiration to live in the world also. Very magical, <laughs> yeah. When uh, when I can go on lesson and I feel that uh, I'm doing a very good job and then working at home is a very wonderful thing. So, uh, I think that I can do something and uh, and I, I'm doing something here. I think that I can uh, say idea and talk with people. That is the first motivation for me to come here.
the second thing that I can have some money for my life to make my life become better and more comfortable. It's a very wonderful website of Adaki because Adaki is the connection between the every people in the world with each other. There are many verbs for us to learn a new language. Innovation is the most important. Not only study language, but also share an idea and culture and everything else in the life. And through the learning and, uh, and teaching, and uh, we can share more ideas and we can share our life better. You know, you know that because each person have uh, their own experience and their own knowledge and their own way of living. And when we meet these people and within that we are, we are discovering a new universe or a new area or something like that. <laughs> so it's wonderful that we have this diversity and we should just learn from each other. But if you at least just learn a second language and expose yourself to a second culture, not only do you understand that culture better, but you understand your own culture better. And if most people just did that and were talking openly and honestly about themselves and other people, I don't think there would be any diversity problems. Because we're all learning from each other. He's a very good student. He studied very well and he just learned for, you know, he just only studied for one month, but now he can speak very much with me. Later on, yeah, the student and the teacher can meet in uh, in a different country, and then uh, the relationship be become very good. We drink coffee together, and we uh, go uh, and I ride a motorbike, and I take them uh, along uh, somewhere beautiful together, and we uh, talk together, and then they come back to their country, and we become teacher and student again. We study again, yeah. The number of refugees worldwide has reached historic levels as tens of millions of people seek asylum from conflicts in their home countries. Even for those able to reach countries willing to take them in, rebuilding their lives and careers in unfamiliar societies often proves challenging. For one group of refugees living in Istanbul, teaching online Arabic lessons to students across the world has offered a way to overcome these obstacles and establish new hope. As well as earning income, they have been able to share their experiences with people from different cultures and backgrounds, cultivating meaningful relationships with students. My name is Rahaf and I'm from Latakia, Syria. Previously, I had a normal but busy life. My name is Abdullah and I'm a Syrian guy from Homs, the capital of funny jokes. Hello, my, my name is Amr. Uh, I'm an Arabic teacher on italki. Uh, I'm from Egypt. Hi, I'm Hossam. I'm from Syria, Al Haseka, and I'm a teacher on iTalki now. Three years ago, I came to Turkey, to Istanbul. Many challenges uh, came in one time. Leaving a country is not, or leaving your home. This is one, it's like fish out of the group. I mean, yeah, my, the challenge that my career is almost dead. This is the only challenge now. Online teaching, yeah, it, it solves this problem, of course, because you can just be wherever and get online and start your class. What italki offered me is like new students I have never met from another continent, way far from me. Once they want to like learn my language, I feel like this is like, I feel sometimes emotional. Italki, Bessa College and NGO Small Projects Istanbul are working together on this project. You know, it's important for people to kind of see um, and get to know someone who's experiencing a difficult time or who um, has had a, a difficult past and to um, just remember people are people are people. We need to remember that, um, you know, we're, we have a shared humanity and I think that gets lost a lot in the media or in the news. I'm teaching Arabic for first year students of Arabic in America. Uh, we both enjoy teaching and learning online. Uh, it's an amazing experience for me as a teacher. I find it so helpful for me, also for the students. Going into it, people might like, like have these assumptions that you're supposed to like learn something about refugees or like understand something new. But I think it's like most valuable to realize that like 
you're not really learning anything new other than that like this is like just just another person just like you my tutor Mohammed was like so nice and so willing to work with my level of speaking and comprehension at the beginning teaching online was a new experience for me and it had a, a lot of challenges but now i'm used to it and honestly i am enjoying teaching arabic on italki i care now i care more i care more about the language i care more about my students teaching arabic is something valuable for me maybe give me hope or i feel gain hope i it's reward for me más de manera instantánea conectando a usuarios disponibles en todo el mundo. Con Lingvi encontrarás personas nativas dispuestas a ayudarte a practicar el idioma que desees aprender. Los usuarios con tiempo libre se mostrarán disponibles para recibir llamadas y de esta forma ganarán recompensas ayudando a otros usuarios. Así es como conectamos personas de forma colaborativa y gratuita en nuestra aplicación. Únete a nuestra comunidad, haz nuevos amigos y mejora en todos los idiomas que quieras. Descarga Lingvi y practiquemos juntos. Este es Peter. Está aprendiendo chino. Ha intentado estudiar por su cuenta con libros, tarjetas de vocabulario y aplicaciones móviles, pero sigue teniendo problemas para hablar. Esta es María. Le encanta aprender inglés, pero no tiene oportunidades para ponerlo en práctica. Con Aitoki, Peter y María pueden recibir clases personales online para hablar con fluidez en otro idioma. Tú también puedes aprender un idioma en Aitoki. Empieza hoy en tres simples pasos. Primero, elige un idioma. Inglés, alemán, chino, francés, japonés. Aitoki tiene profesores para cualquier idioma. Segundo, escoge un profesor. Con Aitoki puedes escoger entre miles de profesores con experiencia de todo el mundo. Tercero, elige el horario de tu lección. Las clases de idiomas online son el mejor método para aprender con profesores nativos. Con Aitoki tendrás un profesor de idiomas personal y conversaciones reales con hablantes nativos. Cada día miles de personas aprenden con profesores internacionales a través de Aitoki. Encuentra un profesor hoy y domina el idioma de tu lección. Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on Italki.com and today we will be talking about three grammar rules to follow when you start learning Spanish. The first one is that as you have already heard, Spanish verbs are always conjugated. That means that they have to match with the subject of the sentence. For example, there are different pronouns in Spanish. Yo, tú, él, ella, usted, nosotros, nosotras, vosotros, vosotras, and Hello. Konnichiwa. Watashi wa Atsuko desu. Thank you for visiting my class. Bienvenido a mi clase de español. Today, I want to introduce some basic phrases, vocabulary, numbers, and question words. This course is designed to design for those who don't have any experience of studying Japanese. So I'm sure you can understand everything. Okay, let's get started. First, I introduce the vocabulary that you use today. This is CD. In Japanese, CD, CD. As we don't have pronunciation C in Japanese, we say CD. Camera, camera. Car, kuruma. When we use R in Japanese, it's pronounced like L in English. We don't have ra, re, ru in Japanese, so this is kuruma. 
Hot and cold. Toke. Bag. Kabang. Card. Square. There. Is. Newspaper. Shinbun. Business card. Meishi. Dictionary. Jisho. Jisho. Key. Kagi. Kagi. Umbrella. Kasa. Kasa. Television is Terebi. Terebi. In Japanese, we don't have V, so we use B instead. Radio. 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 In Japanese, we don't have the pronunciation B, so we say G. Radio. Home. Magazine. Zashi. Zashi. Notebook. Noto. Noto. This means long vowel. Noto. Hi. There are two words for this. Computer and pasokon. Pasokon is abbreviation of personal computer. Pasokon is. Today we use this one. Pasokon. I chocolate. Chocolate. Shoes. Kutsu. Tai. Next time. Next time. This is the same with English. Wine. Next currency. Japanese currency. N. Not yen, but N in Japanese. Dollar. Doru. Doru. And Euro. 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 Okay, let's check from the beginning again. Please repeat after me. CD. Camera. Kuruma. Toke. Kaban. Card. Square. Is. Shinbun. Business card. Meishi. Dictionary. Kagi. Kasa. Terebi. Radio. Hong. Dashi. Noto. Pasokon. Chocolate. Kutsu. Necktie. Wine. Currency. Yen. Dollar. Euro. Okay, next is name of country in Japanese. Most of the vocabulary mm, of our country are from English. So mm, the pronunciation is very similar. Nihon. 
a España. Spain. We don't have double consonant in Japanese, so it's not S P, but S U P. The consonant always has vowel. So Spain. Spain. France. We use F, but it's different from F in English. Not touch, no friction. France. And as we don't have a double consonant, it's not FR. F U R. France. This is very different from English. Igiris. Igiris. This one is from German. Deutsch. Deutsch. Italy. Italia. Italia. Swiss. Swiss. America. America. This word is not from English. Originally, we have Japanese word for China. Chungoku. Chungoku. And language. Konnichiwa, Japanese language. Japan is Nihon. Nihon. And Japanese language is Nihon Go. Add Go after the country's name. Nihon Go. Nihon Go is Japanese. Then how about Hola, lengua española. España is Spain. So Spanish language is Spain, go, add, go. Then how about bonjour, bonjour. France, go, France, go. Yes. Ciao, ciao. Italia, go, Italia, go. Next, ni hao, ni hao. China is chugoku. For Chinese language is chugoku, go. Then how about English? English. English is not Igiris go, America go. No. English is Ego. Ego. Then how about German? German. German. Deutsch go. Deutsch go. Okay, let's make sentences using this together. Okay, let's get the worksheet. Okay, then look at this. The upper is my side, my side. When something is my side, we say this, this. In Japanese, this is kore, kore. Then look at the number one of worksheet. The camera is her side. So she says, Kore. This is camera. This is camera. Camera. Oh, camera. Camera. Okay. Now, X is Kore. This. Y is camera. So the Japanese sentence is Kore wa camera. This. Kore wa. Camera. Okay. Then how about number two? That is a car. That is a car. When the object is far from both of us. Are. Are. So X is are. And why is car? Kuruma, kuruma. The sentence is are wa kuruma desu. Are wa kuruma desu. Okay, look at number three. The clock is a 
boy's side. Your side, your side. Kore. Kore. And in Japanese, clock is toke. Toke. The sentence is Sore wa toke de. Sore wa toke de. Then look at number four. The card is my side. My side. Kore. Card is kado in Japanese. So can you make a sentence? Kore wa kado de. Kore wa kado de. Okay, how about number five? That. That. This is tsukue in Japanese. Tsukue. The sentence is are wa tsukue desu. Okay, next newspaper. This. Kore. Kore wa shinbun desu. Kore wa shinbun desu. Okay, number seven. Business card. The card is your side, your side. Kore. Ne? Kore wa meishi desu. Kore wa meishi desu. Number eight. That. Are. Here is itsu in Japanese. Are wa itsu desu. Ne? Number nine, dictionary. For oh, which one should we use? Kore, sore, are. Kore. Ne? Kore wa jicho de. Number ten. Kore, sore, are. Key is your side. Kore. Kore wa Eleven. That is the key. That. That was. Are. Are was. Television. Okay, last one. Twelve. That is your side. Your side. So that. Ne. これはカバンです。これはカバンです。Okay, next, negative sentence. Look at number one. This is not a radio. This is not a radio. Radio はラジオ in Japanese. ラジオ。ラジオ。This is not a radio. Radio. Negative form is これはラジオじゃありません。これはラジオじゃありません。じゃありません is negative form of this.、ね、これはラジオじゃありません。Then look at number two. That isn't a bus. Bus, bus. In Japanese, bus, bus. That isn't a bus. あれはバスじゃありません。あれはバスじゃありません。Number three, that is not a camera. That is not a camera. それはカメラじゃありません。それはカメラじゃありません。ね Okay, the number four. This isn't a business card. This isn't a business card. So please make negative sentence. Negative sentence. これは名詞じゃありません Then, number, look at number five. Question. Is that a desk? Is that a desk? あれは机
です。かあれは、机ですか ?This is a question form. あれは、机ですか Then, number six, is this a newspaper? Is this a newspaper? これは、新聞ですかこれは、新聞ですか Number seven, is that business card? Is that business card? それは、名刺ですかこれは名刺ですか And let's check the answer. それは名刺ですか ?Answer is yes. Yes. You know how to say yes in Japanese? Yes is はい。はい。So, question is それは名刺ですか ?Answer is はい。名刺です。はい。名刺です。Then, number eight, is that a desk? Is that a desk? あれは机ですかあれは机ですか The answer is no. You know how to say no in Japanese? いいえ、いいえ、机じゃありません。いいえ、机じゃありません。いつです。いいえ、机じゃありません。いつです。ね。Let's check the answer again. When the answer is yes, はい、ナウンです。はい、いつです。はい、机です。And はい、そうです。It's also okay. そうです。そう、it's like so in English. And the answer is no. いいえ、椅子じゃありません。いいえ、机じゃありません。ネガティブフォーム。Or, いいえ、違います。It's also o k a 違います。means, no, that's wrong. Incorrect. Okay, let's practice. Look at number nine. これは辞書ですかこれは辞書ですか What's the answer? これは辞書ですか The answer is yes. はい、辞書です。はい、辞書です。Okay, number ten. これは鍵ですかこれは鍵ですかこれは鍵ですかはい、鍵です。The number eleven. あれはパソコンですかあれはパソコンですかパソコンはコンピューターですかいいえ、パソコンじゃありません。テレビです。これはカバンですかこれはカバンですかアンサイズはい、カバンです。Or, はい。Okay. okay, let's practice. I ask you a question, so please answer in Japanese. Okay. Number one. これは時計ですか Answer is. いいえ、時計じゃありません。カメラです。Number two. あれはバスですか家、バスじゃありません。車です。ママスペイン。それはカメラですか家、いいカメラじゃありません。時計です。ナムフォール。これは名刺ですかこれは名刺ですか名刺です。ビジネスカード。いいえ、名刺じゃありません。カードです。で、ペン。うん、じゃあ、ナンバーファイブ。あれは、机ですか椅子ですか
、うん、I don't know. あれはなんですかあれはなんですか ?And answer is あれは何ですか机です。机です、ね。あれは何ですか机です。あれは机です。It's also okay, but normally we omit the subject when we answer. Okay?Then number six. What's this? What's this? これは何ですかこれは何ですか ?Answer is 新聞です。No.7 それは何ですか ?Answer is 名詞です。Okay, then please next question for number eight. What's that? What's that? あれは何ですかあれは何ですか ?And answer is 椅子です。Okay.I ask you questions, please answer in Japanese.Number nine. これは何ですかでしょうです。Number ten. それは何ですかです11あれは何ですかテレビです。That's one. それは何ですかカバンです。OK。Look at number one. これは鍵です。これは鍵です。This is 佐藤さん。He, 佐藤さん。In Japanese, we add さん after the name. Mr. 佐藤。佐藤さん。ね。さん can be used both for men and women. Number two is 鈴木さん。Number three is 田中さん。はい。This is 佐藤さん。He, 佐藤さんの鍵です。これは、佐藤さんの鍵です。オーナーのナウンです。で、ハーバートナンバーツー。鈴木さん、ディクショナリー。ディクショナリーは辞書です。これは、鈴木さんの辞書です。オーナーのナウンです。で、ナンバーツー。CD, CD. これは田中さんの CD です。Okay, then please make a sentence about number four. Book is Home in Japanese. Home. Okay. これは伊藤さんの本です。Okay. Cover number five. これは高橋さんのカードです。OK, number six. これはミラーさんの本です。Number seven. これは山田さんの雑誌です。Number eight. これは小川さんのノートです。Last one, this is dictionary. これは中田さんの辞書です。辞書。中田さんの辞書です。Okay. And look at number one again. これは佐藤さんの鍵ですか鈴木さんの鍵ですか田中さんの紙ですか
I don't know. I want to ask the owner of this key. これは誰の鍵ですかこれは誰の鍵ですか Then answer is 佐藤さんの鍵です。佐藤さんの鍵です。Okay, please repeat after me question and answer. Question. これは誰の鍵ですか佐藤さんの鍵です。Okay, then let's make sentence about number two. Whose dictionary is this? Dictionary is 辞書。これは誰の辞書ですか ?And answer is 鈴木さんの辞書です。Okay, number three. Whose CD is this? Whose CD is this? CD, CD is this. これは誰の CD ですか ?Answer is 田中さんの CD です。Okay. Okay. In the answer, we can omit the noun. For example, number one, これは誰の鍵ですか We already know we are talking about key. So in the answer, we can say, Tato san no des. We search noun, Tato san no des. And number two, これは誰の辞書ですか Short answer is, 鈴木さんのです。Number three, これは誰の CD ですか Short answer is, 田中さんのです。Like this, we can omit the noun in the answer. Okay, then I ask you questions, so please answer in Japanese. Number four. これは誰の本ですかこれは誰の本ですか The answer is 伊藤さんのです。Or 伊藤さんの本です。It's also okay. Number five. これは誰のカードですか ?Number is 高橋さんのです。Okay, number six. これは誰の本ですかミラーさんのです。Number seven. これは誰の雑誌ですか山田さんのです。Number、eight. これは誰のノートですか小川さんのです。Okay, last one. これは誰の辞書ですか中田さんのです。Okay. じゃあ、えー、じゃあこれは中田さんの辞書ですね。うんえー、Chinese dictionary ですね。Chinese dictionary. Chinese language is 中国語。中国語。中国語。中国語の辞書です。中国語の辞書です。content の noun。Again, no is connector ですね。これは中国語の辞書です。Then look at number one. これは鍵です。鍵です。What is this key for? You can see the picture of 車。これは車の鍵です。車の鍵です。Okay, number two. これは English dictionary. English is 英語。英語。これは英語の辞書です。で、ハーバードナンバー三、スペニッシュ、スペニッシュランゲージ、CD、CD。Can you make a sentence? これはスペイン語の CD です。これはスペイン語の 
TV did. Same, same. Not as young as the same goal. Next. So next, number four, French. French book, French book. これはフランス語の本です。Number five, bank, card, bank. Bank is 銀行 in Japanese. 銀行。これは銀行のカードです。Next, number six, this is Japanese book. Japanese book. これは日本語の本です。これは日本語の本です。No.7、カメラ、マガジン。マガジンって雑誌。雑誌。これは雑誌。これはカメラの雑誌です。No.8、ノッパー、ノッパー、ジャーマン。ジャーマンエス、ドイツ語、ドイツ語、カチュメンザ語、ドイツ語。えっと、これは、ドイツ語のノートです。で、ラストワン、チャイニーズディクショナリー、チャイニーズディクショナリー。これは、中国語の辞書です。これは中国語の辞書ですか日本語の辞書ですかスペイン語の辞書ですか ?I don't know, so I want to ask. これは何の辞書ですかこれは何の辞書ですか ?Question word is 何の。And answer is 中国語の辞書です。Then look at number one. What is this key for? Can you make a question? これは何の鍵ですかこれは何の鍵ですか And answer is 車の鍵です。車の鍵です。Number two. これは何の辞書ですかこれは何の辞書ですか英語の辞書です。Number three question is これは何の CD ですか ?Answer is スペイン語の CD です。Well, let's talk about category contents. We can't omit the noun. Of course, all noun, Suzuki san no des, Sato san no des. We can't omit the noun. But when we talk about category contents, Spain go no des, Kuruma no des is not correct. Kuruma no kagi des, Spain go no CD des. Okay, let's practice conversation, a little longer conversation. Right, look at this. Right, the person A on the left side is asking, What's that? What's that? The object is your side. So, それ your side. それ What's that? それは You remember the question word? それは何ですかそれは何ですかAnd the answer is, CD です。CD です。The next question. Answer is ABCD English. Answer is ABCD English. So question is, 何の CD ですか何の CD ですか And answer is 英語 English. 英語の CD です。Okay. Okay, then、um, from the beginning, please repeat after me. それは何ですか ?CD です。何の CD ですか
。英語の CD です。Okay, next, person B has a car. Person A is asking, What's that? それは何ですか And the answer is, カードです。カードです。And the second question, 何のカードですか何のカードですか The answer is, ホスピタル。病院。病院のカードです。病院のカード。So I'm A, you're B, let's go pray. それは何ですか何のカードですか ?Okay, then you start asking me, I have a card. カードです。病院のカードです。Okay, next. The first question is saying, What's that? これは何ですか And this is m a g a z i n e m a g a z i n e is dash. Dash です。Second question. 何の雑誌ですか Do you remember car? 車の Okay, last one. What's that? これは何ですか Answer is. 本です。Next question. 何の本ですか And the answer is. パソコンの本です。パソコンの本です。Okay, next. I look at number one. これは時計ですね。時計です。And Seiko is the brand of this watch. Do you know Seiko? I have Seiko watch. Okay. これは成功の時計です。これは成功の時計です。時計。で、ね、ブランドのナウン。成功の時計。で、ハーバードナンバーツー。ブランドイズプラダ。プラダ。で、バッグイズカバン。これはプラダのカバンです。Okay, how about number three? これはトニーのパソコンです。Okay, number four is China is not brand, it's country of origin, but we can use the same sentence pattern. China is 中国。これは中国の傘です。これは中国の傘。Yes, umbrella is kasa. Okay. The next one, Samsung TV. Telebi. これは Samsung のテレビです。Number six. これは Canon のカメラです。Number seven. It's a country of origin, not brand. Switzerland is Swiss. 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 ネクタイル。これはバーバリーのネクタイル。ナンバーテン。イタリー。イタリア。イタリア。これはイタリアの靴です。これはイタリアの靴です。ナンバーイレブン
これは、イケアの椅子です。これは、イケアの椅子です。ラストワン。これは、トヨタの車です。えー、じゃあ、look at number one again. これは時計です。これは、オメガの時計ですかロレックスの時計ですか抵抗の時計ですか ?I don't know. これは、どこの時計ですかこれは、どこの時計ですか ?And answer is, 抵抗の時計です。or just 抵抗のです。is okay. Okay, お見つな。抵抗の時計です。or 抵抗のです。then, let's make a question to ask the brand of this bag. これは、どこのカバンですかこれは、どこのカバンですか And the answer is, プラダのカバンです。Or just, プラダのです。プラダのです。Okay? Then please make question sentence word number three. As the brand of this computer. コンピューターはパソコン。パソコン。Okay? これはどこのパソコンですかこれはどこのパソコンですか ?Answer is ソニーなぜ ?As、okay. the country of origin, we can use the same question mark.Umbrella is 傘。傘 in Japanese. 傘。Please make a question. これはどこの傘ですかこれはどこの傘ですか中国の傘です。or just 中国のです。Okay, the R ask you, so please answer in Japanese.No.5、okay. これはどこのテレビですか ?Answer is サムスンのです。No.6 これはどこのカメラですかキャノンのです。ナンバーセブン。これはどこのチョコレートですかスイスのです。ナンバーエイト。これはどこのワインですかフランスのです。ナンバーナイン。これはどこのネクタイですかバーバリンのです。ナンバーテン、これはどこの靴ですかイタリアのです。レバー、これはどこの椅子ですかイケアのです。ラストワン、これはどこの車ですかトヨタのです。で、ね、こちらです。T シャツ、T シャツです。はい、これはどこの T シャツですかうーん、ブランドは CCWO の T シャツです。ブランド CCWO の T シャツです。スペインの T シャツですかい,いえ、スペインの T シャツじゃありません。タイの T シャツです。CCWO is my,、uh, タイ、タイブランドですね。はい。で、next。えー、the let's practice numbers in Japanese. Right. So from zero, let's count up, repeat after me. Zero is from English. Zero. Ichi. Ni. 
三、四、五、六、七、八、九、十、九 and 十 are long vowel。Eleven is ju and uchi, ju uchi, ju uchi. Then how about twelve? Twelve is ju ni, ju san, ju yong, ju o. Then twenty, ni, ju, ni, ju, ni, ju. Yes. How about thirty? Thirty. Thirty what? San ju, forty, yong ju. Three digit numbers. One hundred is yaku, yaku. Two hundred add ni here, ni yaku, ni yaku. Three hundred is not tan yaku, but tan yaku. B de tan yaku. Regular. Four hundred is yong yaku. Five hundred. 五百、six hundred is irregular, not 六百、八六百、六百。Seven hundred is not irregular, 七百、八百。Eight hundred is irregular again, not 八百、八百、八百、八百。Hapiaku has happy here, happy number. Okay, last one, 900. 900. Then so 300, 600, 800 are irregular. There are three exceptions. Okay, next, four digit numbers. 1,000 is 10. 10. And 2,000, 10, but 10. Yeah, but three thousand is not tan sen, but tan zen. B is regular. Four thousand, yong sen. Five thousand, o sen. Six thousand, roku sen. Seven thousand, nana sen. Eight thousand is irregular, not tachi sen. And 9,000 is not irregular. 2,000. Okay, so 3,000 and 8,000 are irregular. Two irregular. Next, five digit number. 10,000. We don't use 10, 10. Instead, we have the unit man in Japanese. 1, man, 2, man, 3, man. And man doesn't have any has any exception. So some man, your man, or man, or man, or man, or man, or man, and one hundred thousand. When we read big large numbers in Japanese, we have to ignore the comma. We have to split here. So at first we read this number, ju, and man, ju man. Okay. And this is 100. Pink number is 100. Yaku man. Yaku man. Okay, then let's try and read this. At first, read pink number 234. man. 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 And last one, can you read this with challenge? At first, read these three numbers. 987, 987, Then read these four numbers. 6,543. Yes. OK, now you can read up to seven digit numbers in Japanese. Okay, next let's practice prices. Prices. Okay, look at number one. 
What's this number? これは3万8000 is greater than 3万8000 8000 and 600 this is irregular again sorry for many irregular 600 600 And as currency, currency is n, n, n. Three thousand eight hundred fifty n. Okay. So sentence is: Toke wa three thousand eight hundred fifty n. This. Okay. Okay. Look at number two. How about what? One thousand, one thousand eight ten, three hundred is irregular. Some yak, some yak, and the currency is euro, euro. How about what? Ten, ten yak, euro. Okay, number three. Passcode, passcode what? Ignore comma. Ten. And nine thousand four hundred. Okay, next one. Umbrella. Casa. 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 Oh, it's easy. Yon. Dollar. カサは四ドルです。Number five テレビ。Big number。テレビは、はい、いろかま。八万五千七百円です。テレビは八万五千七百円。ね。Then カメラは。How much is the camera? I want to ask the price. When we want to ask the price, camera wa ikura desu ka? Camera wa ikura desu ka? This is a question to ask the price. And the answer is nana man roku sen. 300円です。はい。じゃあ、プレイスメイクセンス、How much is the chocolate? Chocolate. チョコレートはいくらですかチョコレートはいくらですか ?8 ドルです。8ドルで。で、then please ask the price of wine. Wine. ワインはいくらですかワインはいくらですか ?answer is 3600円です。3600円。How much is the time? Tai is next time. Next time. Next time, what? Ikura desu ka? Number is 29,500 yen desu. How much is the shirt? Kutsu wa ikura desu ka? Kutsu wa ikura desu ka? 140ユーロです。How much is the chair? Chair. 椅子。椅子。椅子はいくらですか ?92 ドルです。Okay, last one is expensive. How much is the car? 車はいくらですか ?It's no camera. 670万円です。670万円です。Okay, 
Now let's practice a little bit longer conversation. Look at this. Okay. Uh, there is a department store. The person A on the right side, uh, left side, wants to buy a camera. Person B on the right side is a shop clock. Person A is asking, Kore wa? He is asking, country of origin. Kore wa? Doko no camera desu ka? Kore wa doko no camera desu ka? And what's the answer? What's this country? You know? Nihon no desu. Nihon no desu. And ask the price. Ikura desu ka? Ikura desu ka? My please read the number. Niman Sanzen Lokyak and Okay, then let's practice the conversation. Please repeat after me from the beginning. Person A. Korewa Doko no Kamera Deska. Nihon no des. Ikura deska. Niman Tanzen Lokyak and. Okay, so I'm A. Here B. Let's role play. I start. Kore wa doko no kamera deska? Ikura deska? Then you start. Person A. Nihon no des. Niman sanzen lo yakuen. Okay, next. Then let's add a phrase. Excuse me. Excuse me when we ask something. Excuse me. Wa, sumimasen. Sumimasen. Okay, sumimasen. Kore wa doko no. Next tie this car. Next tie this And answer is. Italiano this. How much? Ikura this car. And read the number. Nanasen. Tambiaku and. Next. Number two. Excuse me. Sumimasen. Sumimasen. Kore wa doko no. Okay, this What's this country? Please know this. How much? Ikura desu ka? Okay, please read the number. Ichiman, hasten, hapyaku yen Okay, last one. Excuse me. Sumimasen. Kore wa doko no Pasokon desu ka? And answer is Americano desu. How much? Ikura desu ka? Can I please read the number? Okay. 17万 8,000 yen desu. Okay, that's all for today. Good job. Thank you for visiting my class today. If you want to study with me further, please visit the iTalk website and feel free to try my lesson. Gracias por unirte a mi clase. Si quieres estudiar más conmigo, visita la página web de iTalk y prueba mi clase. Espero que nos vemos pronto. Muchas gracias. Deba, minasan. Sayonara. Arigato gozaimashita. have their own conditions.
and it's very common for beginners to mix them up. So remember this. When you start to conjugate the verbs, they have to match. The second rule is very important as well. The Spanish nouns and adjectives has to be in the same level. Let me explain you this. If you have a noun that is feminine and plural, for example, las mujeres, the adjective that you have to use right after the noun has to be feminine and plural as well. For example, las mujeres españolas. It is the same with the articles las, female and plural. We use this article because, as I say, it's female and plural. The third rule I already mentioned before, and be careful, English speakers, because the adjectives in Spanish go after the noun, not before like in English. This is very common for uh, students that learn Spanish and already speak or know English. When I say it, las mujeres españolas, españolas is the adjective, and I put it after las mujeres. In English, it would be a Spanish woman, but not in Spanish. Okay, there are some occasions where the adjectives go before the nouns. That is true. In this video, and don't forget to subscribe to the italki YouTube channel over here. Take a listen with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hasta luego! Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today I will be talking about seven Spanish words that are similar to their English counterpart. These words are also known as cognates. What a cognate is? A cognate is a word that has the same linguistic derivation that another word and it looks similar and when you pronounce it, it sounds almost the same. And here I will give you seven cognates so you can use them in Spanish as well. The first one is alcohol in Spanish. Guess you know what it means because it sounds pretty similar than in English, doesn't it? Number two is conclusión. This one has a different pronunciation in Spanish, but you will understand definitely when you start learning Spanish. Number three, three, <laughs> hobby. This one is completely similar. We basically took this word from English. Number four, individual. Of course, it's the same word, just different pronunciation. The next one, number five, is piercing. Yes, we use this word with the same pronunciation and meaning. Next one, number six, is informal. I like to use this one in my lessons to explain ways to greet and say goodbye because it's similar in English and is a word that the students understand very quickly. And the last are some words related to sports. If you're learning Spanish and you like sports, you're lucky because most of the words are cognates like football, tennis, baseball, volleyball, hockey, water polo, golf, surf, and so on. As you can see, almost all sports are cognates. So, talking about your hobbies should not be difficult. As you can see, there are many, and I would like to remember you that there are hundreds of cognates, and if you check them, you can be ready to your first Spanish lesson. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the Italki YouTube channel for more tips on learning Spanish. Take a lesson with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hasta luego! Hi everyone, it's Caroline here and I teach English on italki. Today I am going to be talking about business idioms or idioms you might hear in your office or in your workplace. A student asked me a really good question the other day. He asked me whether, because I'm an, a native English speaker, 
do I know every single idiom? And the answer is no. Idioms are phrases or expressions that come from a particular place or a particular age group. So idioms are different in the UK to idioms in the United States. I have chosen five business idioms to talk to you about today, and you may hear them in an office in the UK or in the States. So hopefully they will be super useful for you. Idiom number one is the big picture. Imagine you go into a meeting and your boss says to you, you've lost sight of the big picture. What does that mean? That means that you are thinking too much about the small details of the project and you are so interested in those little details that you don't remember what it is you're trying to achieve. So always keep sight of the big picture. The second idiom is to go the extra mile. Now imagine you're in an interview and the interviewer says to you that they are looking for someone who always goes the extra mile. What does that mean? Does it mean they want you to run around the office every day? No, it means they want you to do more than just what is in the job description. They want you to go that little bit further and to take on extra responsibilities. That is going the extra mile. The third idiom is a win-win situation. A win-win situation means everybody gains something. A really good example of this is these videos that I'm making for italki. Italki gains some content for their website, some lessons for their learners, and I have a platform where students can see me and book lessons with me. It's a win-win. Italki wins and Caroline wins. The fourth idiom is word of mouth. So an example of this is think about how you found out about italki. Did you find italki by searching on Google or did you find italki because one of your friends recommended it to you? Recommendations from friends are word of mouth. It can be positive or it can be negative. If your company gets bad word of mouth, it is going to be a very difficult time for your company because people really listen to the opinions of their friends. So make sure whatever you do, <laughs> you have good word of mouth about it. The fifth and final business idiom is to touch base. My manager used to say this to me a lot. To touch base means to have a very quick and short meeting about a project or something that you are working on. It might only be five minutes of your time, but in that time, you will check that your understanding of the project is the same as your manager's understanding of the project. So I have a challenge for you. In your next lesson, I want you to ask your teacher if you can touch base about what you have learned in your lessons so far. This could be five minutes at the end of the lesson where you review all of the different subjects that you have been studying. You're touching base about the things you have covered so far. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to italki by clicking somewhere. <laughs> And you can take a lesson with me by clicking on my teacher profile in the description box. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Welcome back to the Stop Being Boring When Speaking English video series. When speaking to native English speakers, it's useful to use a variety of vocabulary to make your conversation sound more interesting and flow. Why not spice up your language a little bit and impress others with your speaking abilities? In this next video, we will take a look at some American and British slang. Number one, American. John Hancock. John Hancock. Mm -hmm. So that's a person. It's a name of a person, yes. And it's American slang. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it? Um, I just got John Hancock. Does it mean that wasted? Certainly not. Give, give me an example. Okay, so can I please have your John Hancock at the bottom of this paper? Come on, you gotta get it now. Is it your signature? Yes, you got it! That was easy. Okay, awesome. Number one, British. Peak. What does peak mean? Like, uh, taking a peak. No, that's, that's Sorry, that's not taking a peak. That, that's not smack. This is taking a peak. That's just like taking a peek, that's not slang. Oh.
Like the flying hot peak. Like the peak of a mountain? That's not slang. That's actually yeah, that is the peak of a mountain. I don't know. Tell me. Okay, let me give you an example. So say you go out, you go out one night and you lose your purse, your keys. Is it like phone. the most horrible situation you can be in? Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, that's so peak. You'd be like, oh, so, yeah. How was your night? It was so peak. I just got the fire. That's so peak. Exactly. So it's like the peak of badness, I guess. Oh my god. Yeah, okay, so the peak. Two, American. Jacked. Jacked. Does, Jacked. That, does that mean like hench? What does hench mean? Like, say you go to the gym. Don't answer back with the slang word. <laughs> <laughs> so the British equivalent of jacked would be hench, I think. Okay. So if someone's like really ripped. Yes, exactly. Okay. Go to the gym, work out a lot. Like, Whoa, look at him, he's so jacked. We would say hench. Number two, British. Peng. 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 P E N G. Peng. Like someone being hanged on the head with something? Or. <laughs> just like, you know, bang. Peng. Similar, I don't know. I guess it's a little similar. Um, no. Give me an example. Uh, okay, so for example, say you're eating a cake, it's delicious, you can say, oh, this is peng. Does it just mean delicious? Mm, you could use it in other contact texts as well. like it hits the spot, you know? Yeah, but I could also say that your eyes are peng. Oh. Or a person is peng. Just mean like extraordinarily awesome? Basically. Oh, if, you, okay. if you're talking about a person, you might even say peng ting. Peng ting. Like he's a peng ting. Okay. This is mostly like he's like a ten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like the like the top of the top. Yeah, basically. Number three, American. I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. What a nightmare. I blew it. Yeah. So that means that you've completely ruined the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Say like I didn't make it into didn't make it into school, so my parents will not be proud of me. I blew it. Yeah, but you locked up late to work. Don't really ever knew that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm never late. <laughs> Number three, British. Having a mare. Having a mare. Having a mare. A nightmare. Like, horrible, real nightmare. In realistic, in reality, basically. Very good. Okay. That's exactly that's it. a lot easier than that. Yeah, well, I thought I'd go into you. Having a mare? You were having a mare before. I was having a mare before. Yeah. Not understanding anything she was saying. Yeah, exactly. So, there you have it. There's our British and American slang. Tell us what you thought of it. Did you understand it? And we'll see you next time. My name is Vũ Nguyễn. Tên tôi là Vũ Nguyễn. It's really amazing thing for me. From uh, from Ajaxi, I can meet people around the world, and they can give me more energy to live and more inspiration to live in the world also. Very magical, <laughs> yeah. When uh, when I can go on lesson and I feel that. Uh, I'm doing a very good job and then working at home with a very wonderful team. So, uh, I think that I can do something and, uh, and I, I'm doing something here. I think that I can uh, say idea and talk with people. That is the first. Hello, hello everybody. This is Sarah Rose. Nice to see you. Welcome to class today. Uh, my name is Sarah Rose. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome back. If this is your second or third class, have you been coming to a lot of classes? Please tell me if you've come to my class before. Please write hello. Like I said, my name is Sarah Rose and today's class is about CVs. I think two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I did another class about writing a CV. 
So this class is going to talk a bit more about that. It's going to be different information. It's different to the last class. So you should learn something new if you were in that class. Um, and we're going to mainly talk about the objective or the professional profile, which is the section that you have at the top of your CV. So we're going to talk about how to write that look at some examples and at the end of class I want you to write your own uh, objective or professional profile um, so that you so that I can see it and then you can put it in your CV. So let's get started. I'm going to share my presentation. Here we go that should come up now please. Um, hi so please say hello. Uh, in the comments. You can write comments on italki.com forward slash I stay at home or you can write comments on YouTube. I have them both available here so I should be able to see both of them. Yes, do you have a pen and paper or you can make notes on your phone or laptop or you can take screenshots throughout the presentation of anything you think is useful. We're going to be looking at lots of examples today um, because I think that's really important that you can see people using English, how we use English in a CV and you can see some examples. Um, so please type in. OK, what I would like you to do is say hello, say where you are, where you live, maybe or where you're from and what is your job or because we are talking about applying for jobs today, what job do you want? What job do you are you looking for? What job do you need your CV so that you can get it? Here's an example. So my name is Sarah Rose. I am from Wolverhampton in England. If you know Wolverhampton, please write that in the comments too. I'd love to know. I'm from Wolverhampton, but I live in Alicante in Spain. Um, so if you don't know, Alicante is in the south of Spain and it's on the coast, on the east. It's in the southeast-ish of Spain. It's by the sea. And the weather today is horrible. It is raining and it is windy. And Wolverhampton is in the middle the West Midlands are in the UK. It's in the middle of the UK, near Birmingham. A lot of people know Birmingham. Um, and what is my job? Well, I am an English teacher. Before I was an English teacher, I used to work in the UK, uh, a number of different charities, including charities that helped people who were looking for employment, who were looking for jobs. I also worked in training, training young people, training adults and training volunteers. So that was my career. And now I live in Spain and I am an English teacher. Let's have a look. Has anybody said hello yet? There's a slight delay, but say hello. Hi, we've got Maringo Carr. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi, Virginia. Nice to see you. Hello, Magda. Um, uh, we've got somebody in from Madrid. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. So please write uh, where you are watching from, where in the world. Um, and if you are looking for a job at the moment, what is the job you are looking for now? Let's have a look. Hello, Anna. I was in your previous class. Um, she said she usually works as an IT co consultant. She's currently unemployed. Perfect. So you're here to learn about your CV. Nice to see you again, Anna. I remember you were in my last class and you had lots of answers to my questions. So I hope you can get involved today. Magda from Madrid. Nice to see you again. Fantastic. Thank you for coming back. Oh, cool. We have some comments on YouTube as well. Robert. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Brilliant. Eskil, hello, nice to meet you, Eskil. Thank you, um, Robert from Valencia. Um, great, and I think Robert was here last time too because I spoke for ages about Valencia, how much I like it. 
Um, great. Well, thank you so much for coming. Please keep saying um, who you are, where you're from, maybe what your job is or what job you want, what job you are looking for. Uh, if you you know probably already, so I am an English teacher, but I specialise in helping people prepare for job interviews. So a lot of the lessons I teach are about writing CVs, writing cover letters and general job interview preparation and coaching. Um, and I help people both with the English that you need for a CV or a cover letter or a job interview, the, the specific English language, as well as talking about people's strengths, people's experiences um, and achievements and making sure that you put them correctly in. Ah, Jessica says, hello. Hi, Jessica, nice to meet you. Where are you watching from today? Hello, Elisa, fantastic. Um, my sister's name is Jessica. So that's a very popular name in the UK. Uh, oh yes, I also do general English classes. Okay, please keep saying hello where you are and what is your current job or what job are you looking for? That would be brilliant. Okay, so today we are looking at CVs, particularly the professional profile or the objective. This has a lot of names. Sometimes we call it the professional statement, even the personal statement, career goal, career headline. These are all different names for the short section of text that comes at the beginning of your CV, after your name and before everything else, that introduces you to the person who is going to read your CV. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So I hope this is useful and hopefully we will write our own at the end. Now, some of you, some of you were in my last class about CVs, I think. So do you remember, we asked this last lesson, if you weren't here last lesson, you can also guess, make a guess. Do you remember how much time do recruiters spend looking at each CV? Is it seconds, minutes, hours? Recruiter for, I've got some Spanish translations today. So if you're Spanish, the recruiter is the el reclutador or la reclutadora. Um, the person who looks at the CV, reads it, decides who to interview. How much time do they spend looking at the CV? Please type in your guess. Or if you can remember, do you remember what we said? We said this last week. Do you remember? Please say your guess in the comments. Ah, oh, we have some more people joining us too. Hello, Javier from Toledo. Ooh, beautiful. Oh, we know about Toledo because it's so famous in Spanish history, isn't it? And literature. Um, Brilliant. Okay. Hi, Javier. So if you can type your guess or if you can remember, please write what you remember. How long does a recruiter spend when they get your CV and they look at it? What do you think? Let's have a look. Okay. We've got a guess of maybe 30 seconds. Oof, is it 30 seconds? It's actually 7.4 seconds. So about eight seconds, not very long at all. Okay, yeah, Anna says, Javier says one to two minutes maybe. Oh, I wish, I wish they did. I wish that was true. Um, about two minutes if you are lucky. If you are lucky is a good point. If somebody likes your CV, they will look at it for longer. But this is the average. So that means sometimes they look at the CV for less time. And often they just stop looking if they see a mistake. So this is a challenge that I think a lot of people face when they are writing a CV in English, not in your mother tongue, when you have to translate your CV into English. Because you cannot have any errors in your CV. If there is a spelling error or a grammar error, 
maybe the recruiter will stop looking. And that's very difficult if you are writing in English and English isn't your first language. That's a very difficult uh, challenge. So when I work with students who are trying to find jobs in the English speaking market or English speaking countries, we need to make sure there are not any spelling or grammar errors or language errors. It's really important. Um, okay, so we don't have a long time to impress recruiters. So today we're going to talk about the professional objective. Let's just look at a bit of vocabulary first. Hopefully you know these words um, already, but I want to run through them to make sure. Have a little read through. Do you know what all of these mean? And then I will give the Spanish translations. Let me see. Javi says a few. Yeah, it's not a lot of time to impress the recruiter. Javi, Javier says that's correct. You don't have long. You have to move quickly. <laughs> um, it's a very short time to impress the recruiter. Exactly. OK, let's look at these. So do you know what a CV is? Well, often in Spanish, we say CV as well, but it's your curriculum. So this is your resume. Resume is the uh, American term, American English, and CV is British English. Um, and this is the document that has all of your employment and education history. Usually we have a CV with a cover letter or these days, not a letter, but an email that is written in the style of a cover letter. Um, so the cover letter gives more detail and more specific motivation about why you want this job. Sometimes in, uh, in American English, we call this the letter of motivation, why you want the job and more details about your experience. The CV and the cover letter together are usually the job application. Although we often nowadays, especially in the UK, we are seeing more and more job application forms instead of a CV and cover letter because it's more it's a more fair process of recruitment. So it's a more um, in that process with a form. It's more uh, equal for everybody who applies. So often we see that. Um, we have recruiter, we've already said, the person who chooses which CV is successful. And then we have the job description, the person specification. Now, these are two things that are often on the same page. They're quite similar, but they are separate. A job advert will usually have the job description which describes what will you do in this job? What are the responsibilities of the job? What is the remit? What will you uh, be expected to do um, and everything? And then the person specification is where it explains what person they want. So the job description might have many different things on it that you will need to do in this job. But the person specification will say how many years experience you need to have, uh, what qualifications you need to have and what skills. So do you need to be creative? Do you need to be uh, good with numbers? This might appear on the person specification. And then if your application is successful, you might get an interview. La entrevista. So this is when you meet the person, you speak with them, you answer questions. The CV and cover letter, the aim of these is to get an interview. It's the first step in order to get to the interview and it's really important. At the interview, you can then show your personality, what type of person you are, your strengths, the way you communicate. The interview is a fantastic opportunity, especially if you are not a native English speaker, because they get to see your personality and your energy. But we need the CV to be correct in order to get to the interview. OK, so first of all, do you know what 
order the CV is in. Now, I am sure you know the order of a CV, but what I want to do here is to have all of the section titles so that you know that your CV has the correct sections and you know what we call them in English. So look at all of these. What I want you to do is try to type in the comments if you can or write down if you have a pen and paper, what order do you think these go in? Which one do you think comes first at the top of the page? So when we say order, we mean what comes first, second, third, fourth, fifth, it's el, el orden, the order of the content of the CV, what order does it go in? So please have a go at typing in the comments on YouTube or in um, on italki and see if you can put these in the correct order. Some of them are easier than others. I hope you know which comes first and then we have, maybe you know what comes last, but what order does everything go in the middle? I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to do that. Okay, we have a couple of guesses so far. Thank you. I'll give you a couple more seconds before I give the answers so you can see the page. What order do you think it's in? Okay. I'm going to go to the next slide now to start showing you the answers, I think. But we've got a couple of guesses. So your name, correct. The thing that comes first is your name. This is what you have at the top of the page, your name. And at the bottom, we usually have the references. So the question then is what comes between the name and the references? What order does that come in? So, okay, let's see some guesses. We've got name, contact details, profile, employment before profile. Ah, okay. Virginia, your name, contact details, profile, objective, education, employment history, references, volunteering, and additional skills. Okay, good. Name, contact, education, employment, skills. Good. Okay, Elisa. Okay. For your guess, this is on YouTube. Your name, contact detail, details, profile, yeah, employment history, education, additional skills, volunteering, hobbies, references. Ah, uh, Elisa, I think you've got the closest to what I thought too. Very, very nice. Okay. Jessica as well. Okay. Okay. So let me show you the order I said. Now, this might not be a hundred, it's slightly flexible, but we start with your name, correct? I think most people did say that. Then the contact details, so your phone number, your address, your email address underneath your name. Then your profile or objective. This comes before everything else. It's the introduction to your CV and it's very, very short. It's short. It's not a long paragraph. It's a short paragraph. Then we have your employment history, then education, um, and at the bottom references. I put these in white because these are optional. We don't have to include any hobbies. Uh, sometimes we do because maybe the hobbies are relevant or maybe they're really interesting. You know, maybe you were on TV, you were on MasterChef because you love cooking and you were on MasterChef. That's really interesting. So we put it in because it's interesting, but we don't have to. Again, additional skills, we don't have to include it. But if we've got specific professional qualifications or training, for example, in using Microsoft Excel or in health and safety, in using uh, dangerous substances, something like that, we would put that and we can put it under the education. 
Again, volunteering is kind of optional. A lot of people might not have volunteered, but we can include it. If the volunteering is very relevant to the job you are applying for, you can include it in your employment history. Uh, you can include it as work experience. You must be clear that it is volunteering, not paid work. But often we see, uh, and there are two reasons we often might do this. Firstly, if you are applying for a job where you have to have experience, but it doesn't matter if it is paid. So for example, if you are applying for a job in healthcare and you have volunteer experience working in a healthcare setting or in, a, in care work, you can put that in your work experience because it's relevant to the job you are applying for and it doesn't matter that it wasn't paid. Um, that's what volunteering is. It's work that you, it's unpaid. Well, it's when you choose uh, to do um, some activities that, and you're not paid for them. Um, so another reason that we might include volunteering in our employment history is when we are applying for a job in the charity sector. If you want to work for a charity like the Red Cross or UNICEF, then you might uh, put your volunteering because it's really relevant and it shows that you are passionate about the cause. You are so passionate that you decided to volunteer. And then we can put it in the work history. The other time I say you should include volunteering is if you have recently moved to the UK or to an English speaking country or you are looking for work in an English speaking country and you do not have any work experience in an English speaking role. So if all of your work experience is in your native language, in your first language, if all of your work experience, for example, is in Spain, and it was only using Spanish and you didn't use English, but you did a volunteer position in England or in Australia or in Canada and you had to use English, you should include this in your CV because it shows that you can use English in a business setting. And if you don't have any volunteer experience in England or Ireland or wherever, and you only have work experience in another country um, without using English, you can think about maybe doing some volunteer work to improve your languages. I know it's not always possible. It is difficult to volunteer sometimes um, because you need to work. But if you are able to, it is a good way to add some English speaking experience. So for that reason, I say you can put volunteering with employment history or with your hobbies um, if, you, if you don't think it's very relevant to the job. Some people suggested putting education first. Now, I think it's not a definite rule. In the UK, usually people put their work experience first because experience is more important than education. In some other countries, education is more important than, than experience. People really want to know your degree and qualifications. In the UK, it isn't quite like that. So you don't have to put education first. But if you are looking for an academic job or a job where um, where you must have a certain level of education, you must have a PhD or you must have a master's, you may decide to put it first. Also, if you don't have a lot of work experience, but you do have a good qualification, you can put education first. When I started teaching, I had a lot of work experience that wasn't relevant to teaching, but I did have a teaching qualification. So I put my qualifications, my education first because it was the most important thing. And then I put my other experience underneath. Another point is that often 
our employment history can be a little bit mixed. Uh, we might have some customer services work, some management work, some IT work, some teaching work. It's all, it's very complicated. Usually we put our employment history in chronological order. That means we put the most recent experience first and then we work backwards to the, the least recent, the, the oldest experience. But we can divide it into relevant experience and other experience. So, for example, um, you could say if you, for in, in my example, I put my teaching experience as one section and all of the things I have done related to teaching. And then I have other experience. I put less detail, it's shorter, and it's just to show that I don't have any gaps in my CV, but I was doing something different. You can do that in a CV, especially in the UK, it's okay. You really want the most important relevant things at the beginning um, and the other things you can put on the next page or lower down. Okay, um, so do let me know if you have any questions. I think people did quite well on the orders. So let's see if you can do this. Now we have the order. I want to see if you can uh, put these pieces of information into the correct section of the CV. So for example, the first one is retail manager. Gap, 2008 to 2010. Where does that go in the CV? Does it go under references? No. Does it go under your name? No. Um, so this would go under employment history. This is an example of employment history. So do you know where the other sections go? I'm going to read them out so that you can hear them and then we'll go through the answers and then we'll start looking at the professional profile. Okay, so we have fluent in English, available on request, piano, grade seven, University of the Basque Country, master's degree in business management, and full UK driving license. So which section do each of those go in? Do you know? Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, thank you for sending in your guesses for the order. They all look very good. Well done, good Virginia, yeah. Nice, I would, Virginia, I would usually put the references at the end, as you can see here. Um, but I can see if you think, yeah, I would put it after additional skills. Good, Javier, very good. Nice, okay. So let's have a look. Where do you think fluent in English goes? Uh, I'm gonna show you. So fluent in English, well, this would probably go in additional skills. Um, it's another skill. It's not a qualification, so it can't go in education, but we would put it in skills. Ask yourself, do you have your language skills on your CV? Have you put on your CV that you are fluent in Spanish or Italian or your mother tongue or Chinese? Have you put all the languages? Because being bilingual is a very important skill and you need to have it on your CV. So do put that, oh, we've got a guess in. Yeah, correct, Anna, additional skills, fluent in English. Very, very good, okay. Number three, available on request. Where would we put that? What is available on request? Ah, Javier says profile or objective. It's a good guess, but it's not in your profile or objective. No, it's not. Where do we put that? That is a funny phrase, but it's very useful. Available on request, we put with our references. References are available on request. Now, what is a reference? A reference is somebody who the recruiter can contact in order to check that you that your CV is correct. Um, so where you worked or what qualifications you've got. So we say references are available on request, Javier. Yes, you did do a good guess, Javier, but we put that in the references. If you don't want to put the references contact information on the CV, 
you can just say available on request. Um, piano, grade seven, it's probably not relevant to the job usually. So we usually wouldn't put this in education. It might be additional skills, but it will probably be hobbies. Um, this is not, if it's not relevant to the job, we put it in hobbies. Maybe it is relevant depending on the job you're applying for um, and you might put it in additional skills. University of the Basque Country, that is education and then full UK driving license would also be additional skills. So let's have a look at those. Great. So we have employment history. You put your job title and the dates, education, the name of the university and the degree. Additional skills, uh, maybe you put your language skills, your driving license, hobbies. I put in piano grade seven because we have a qualification here. It's a hobby. Maybe it isn't relevant for the job, but it does show that you are committed, you are hardworking um, and that you got a you passed an exam. So it's nice to put in the grade here and then available on request for references. Uh, oh, we've got a question from Eliza, uh, from Erica, sorry. Hi, Erica. If you are not fluent, fluent, can we put the level like this? Good knowledge of English, B2. Yes, that is a very good way of putting it. Okay. So if you are not fluent in English, what do you write? Well, first of all, check the person's specification. What level of English do they need? If they need you to be fluent in English and you're not, it's going to be very difficult for you to get a job interview if you aren't fluent. So do think, do check the person's specification and then you can put in your level of English. And I think what you've written here is nice. Uh, good knowledge of English B2. B2 indicates the level. Not everybody knows this framework. So this is the European framework of languages. B1, B2, C1. We use it in Europe. In other countries, they might not use it. So you might want to put upper intermediate or advanced or proficient, as well as the number and letter. My advice to you is do be, be honest about your level and think about how do you know your level? So often I meet students and they say they are B1 level English, but their spoken English is much higher than B1. Their spoken English is very good. So if they put B1, if you put B1 on your CV, it looks like your English is worse than it is. And then you have less opportunity of getting a job. So don't just put the lowest level. You want to be honest about what you can do in English. So you can check your level, you can look up the SEFRA levels and assess yourself. There are many free online courses. Maybe you recently did a course in English that was B2, so you know you have achieved B2. Maybe you have a certificate. But do think carefully about how you are deciding your level of English. Um, and, and I think it's okay to specify if your level is different um, for different skills. So if you are looking for a job in customer services, your spoken English is much more important than your written English. So you might want to specify, my spoken English is B2, my written English is B1, um, just to help be more specific and to make sure you don't have to just put B1 because your writing is B1 if the job doesn't involve writing. Uh, so yeah, so that's a good way of writing it, Erica, but also just think, um, yeah, yeah, just think about what your actual level is. I can see another question from Anna. Okay, Anna says, is it correct to say that you don't have a certificate, but you were living in the UK during some time, so you think it is B2? Okay, um, again, what I would do if you don't have a certificate and you don't know exactly what the level is, then try to try to get some evidence so that you are confident in what you say, whether that's just an online assessment or speak to your teacher about what level you are 
at that point. Um, if you think you are B2, can you take a, a test? To, and I mean a free test online, you know, a free assessment test to see what level your grammar is. Could you try to have a B2 style mock exam with a teacher just to check that that is correct? Um, or look at the European framework. It's free online. And do you answer all the questions for B2? Yes. It says for B2, you are able to write different types of texts, for example, emails and articles. Can you? If you can, if you can say yes, then you can self-assess as B2. Um, most recruiters really are not experts in, in languages, especially in the UK. You know, many people in the UK only speak English, so they are not experts. So they're not trying to catch you out or test you on your language skills, but they do want to have an indication. Um, okay, so Erica, you took a test and achieved B2. So yeah, you can put that you could put that in your education if you have a certificate in it as well, that you have B2. Um, but if your spoken English is higher, then maybe you want to specify that. Okay. Or maybe you want to say upper intermediate or B2 slash C1, if you're currently studying C1. Um, all right, what we're going to talk about now is the professional profile. So as Javier said, this isn't where we say available on request. This is when we talk about ourselves. I want to start with an example for you. Uh, professional profile example, okay? I'm going to read it out and then point out a few elements of the professional profile. Secondary school teacher looking for a position in a state school where I can apply my eight years of experience and curriculum development skills to help students achieve their potential. Okay. This is a good professional objective, but it is quite a long sentence. So let's break it up a bit. Here we have the subject. We don't say I, we're talking in the third person. Secondary school teacher looking for a position in a state school. This is the main pieces of information here. Okay, it's a secondary school teacher and what are they looking for? A position in a state school. State means a non-private school in the UK. In American English, we might say a public school, but in the UK, we call it a state school. Um, so the secondary school teacher is looking for an, a position in a state school. We have the job title and the objective. Then we add more information. So what type of state school does he want? He adds more information about the state school or she, I don't know why I'm saying here, it might be she, he or she is looking for, gives more information about the state school. They want a state school where I can apply my eight years of experience and my curriculum development skills, okay, to help students achieve their potential. This section of the objective is a style we can use to add more detail about our skills and our experience. And this is a nice structure for you to use in your personal objective, uh, your professional objective. So you say, first of all, your job title and what you are looking for. And then you summarize some of your experience in the second half of the objective, where I can apply my eight years of experience and curriculum development skills to help students achieve their potential. Um, I want to point out a couple of elements of the grammar here. The, the sentence here is where I can apply and then you put the skills and then you put to. So we have how you will achieve something and then what you will achieve. So some other examples we could say here is where I can apply my creativity, my skills in creativity to increase sales in the department or where I can apply my 
teamwork skills to improve company morale. We're connecting your skills with the impact that you will have at the job. And this is really important because the professional objective needs to show the employer what you will bring to the job. Um, what else do I want to point out here? I'm really sorry. I said it was in the third person, but it isn't actually in the third person because they say where well, I can apply my eight years of experience. So it is in the first person. But we don't start the sentence with I because in a CV, we don't need to. And it doesn't look good to start lots of sentences with I. This sentence really means I am a secondary school teacher, but we don't write I am. We just start with the job title. Secondary school teacher looking for a position in a state school where I can apply my eight years of experience and curriculum development skills to help students achieve their potential. OK, I know it's a bit long, so we're going to look at some other examples to hopefully make this easier. OK. Eliza says, excellent example. Good. I'm glad you like it. Take a screenshot. Maybe you can use it. OK, so why do we include the professional profile? We need to know the purpose so that we know what to put in it. Some people don't include a pro profile on their CV. They decide they don't want to. They just they think it doesn't look good. I recommend that you do include it in your CV, especially if you are looking for a job in a new country or if you are changing your job, I think it really helps the recruiter to understand your CV. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when you see a CV, you have loads of information, maybe on two pages, maybe three pages. It's, it's a lot to look at. You've got education, employment, hobbies, all these dates, all these job titles. And it can be confusing. What is the most important information here? What do we need to, to find? Are they suitable? It's quite hard work. If you put in a professional profile, you make it easier for the recruiter to understand you. You make it easier for them to know who you are, what your experience is, and why your CV is good. And if it's easier for the recruiter, it's better because it's quicker for them. Um, so I really recommend including one, especially if you're trying to apply for a job in English and it's a bit difficult for you because it's not your first language. The professional profile introduces your CV. So like any introduction, it gives the most important information. It highlights it. So if you have lots of different jobs, you've been working for 10 years in IT, lots of different jobs over 10 years. In your professional profile, you can say, I have 10 years of experience. It summarizes everything and it's the most important thing. The other good thing about the professional profile is it is a small bit of your CV that you can make specific to every job you apply to. In the previous example, that person said they are looking for a job in a state school. If they wanted a job in a private school, they can just change that. So it says private school or independent school. Um, and then it is specific for that job. And that's very nice. So here's an example. If the job advert or the job description two years of experience, well, in your professional profile, you can write three years of experience or four years of experience. And that means the recruiter knows they need someone with two years of experience and they see you have four. Brilliant. You make it specific to the job application and it's an easy section of the CV to change for each application. And you need to change your CV for every application you do. So um, this is good. Um, and it's also useful to explain a career change or if you have moved country, um, it's a it's a useful section to explain that. So if you are if you are looking to move to relocate to move to the UK or move to America, in your professional profile or objective, 
you can state that you have recently relocated or you are currently relocating to the UK. And that is useful because if all your experience is in Spain or is in Poland or is in Russia, the employer might think, hmm, they live in Russia. They don't live in the UK. They won't be able to work here. Um, but if you put in your uh, professional profile, I have recently relocated to the UK from Russia, then when they see that your experience is in Russia, it's not a big problem. So this is what we can do with the professional profile. We can introduce and we can really convince the person that we are specifically qualified for this job. Um, as well as on your CV, LinkedIn has a space for professional objectives. Um, and so you can use the same one on your LinkedIn profile. And you can also use it maybe if you have other social media like Twitter, if you use Twitter professionally, or if you have a website, or if you have um, maybe not a business card, but if you have a uh, if you're freelance, for example, if you're autonomo and you want to advertise your services, you can use it on there as well. If you speak at a conference and you need a biography, you can use it there. So we can use a professional profile in lots of situations. So it's very useful. OK, so here's uh, I already showed you a good example. Elisa said an excellent example. This is not an excellent example. I'm going to read it through and I want you to see if you can find why it isn't very good. OK, if you can think of anything that looks bad, note it in the comments while I read and then I will talk through the mistakes. OK. I am a friendly and hardworking project manager who loves to work in a team and individually. I am looking for a job working for a large private company but I also like to work in small organizations or even charities. My experience also includes customer services and computer programming. Organized, ambitious, friendly, enthusiastic, hardworking with good time management and communication skills. Okay, so can you see anything here that you don't like? What needs to change in this example? Let me go through some of the mistakes. OK, Anna says it is too long. It is too long. It's four sentences, but it's not just too long because it's not just that there is too much information, but actually some of the information is not important and some of it they say twice. OK. So first of all, I am a. We don't need to start with this. We can start with a friendly and hardworking project manager. We don't need to say I at the beginning. OK, so that is already not right. Javier says, oh, yeah, it's not specific. It's long and ambiguous. That is an excellent word. Ambiguous means it's not specific. It's not clear who it's for. Correct. OK. Um, and that is exactly the point here. I want to work for a large company, but I also like to work in small organizations. Well, it's not relevant. Are you applying for a job in a big organization or a small one? Choose for the job you're applying for, make it specific. Good, excellent. Virginia said it's not clear. No, it's not clear. Are they a computer programmer or a project manager? I don't know. It isn't clear and it doesn't help explain the CV. It's more confusing, actually. So excellent, Virginia. Thank you. Um, Elisa says it's too long and recruiter will not read it all. Exactly. It is too long. A recruiter won't read all this information. It repeats itself. So friendly here and friendly there. We don't need to say both things and hardworking. And also what we have here is a list of generic skills. So by generic, I mean anybody can say this. Anybody can say I'm organized and ambitious and friendly 
and enthusiastic? How do we know you actually are? And so just listing skills isn't a useful thing to do. We should only put in skills when we can prove it, when we have evidence. Um, if you are friendly, how do you show that you are friendly? Do you have evidence from your job? Do you have feedback? Were you promoted? Um, were you rewarded for being friendly in your job? And if you can't show that, it's not helpful to include skills. Sometimes we know, we know that we are good at time management, but it's not useful to put it in the CV unless we have evidence. Um, okay, very good. I think you're right. This one is too long and it's not specific and it repeats itself. So what do we include? We do include our job title or maybe not your current job title, but a summary of your career. We do include how much experience we have. We do include any unusual or important qualifications. And then we include a career goal that matches the job. The most important thing is when we read a professional profile, it should be clear what job the person is applying to. In the previous example, we didn't know, did she want to be a computer programmer, a project manager? We don't know. We need to know from the professional profile. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now, I'm just thinking of the time. Let's have a look at some more examples of good examples. And then we will see, look at a template so that you can write your own. Okay. So here are three examples. Now, like I said, when we read the professional profile, we should be able to know what job the person is applying for. So as I read these through, can you see, is it clear what job this person wants? Okay, so number one, what job do they want? Healthcare professional looking for a position as a clinical practice assistant where I can use my award-winning writing, research and leadership skills. Okay, this is a lovely short objective. What job is this person applying for? Can you see? It's not healthcare professional. That is a summary of their career. It's a general term for their, for their profession they are a healthcare professional. The job they are looking for is a clinical practice assistant. And that is probably the same job as the job title that they are applying to. So it's very nice to include the job title from the job advert in your professional profile. It looks very specific to that job. Uh, Javier says, as a clinical practice assistant. Brilliant. Well done. Exactly. It's as a clinical practice assistant. OK, let's do two and then three. Customer service manager with over seven years of experience in food retail, seeking an opportunity to use management skills to improve customer satisfaction. What job is that person looking for? And number three marketing executive looking for a search engine optimization position where I can apply my 15 years of IT experience and use my SEO skills to increase site traffic and search engine placement. This is very specific language for marketing and search engines. Like Google is a search engine. So don't worry if that seems unclear unless you work in marketing, in which case you should understand. Um, but let's have a look. Okay, so number one, we got clinical practice assistant. What was number two? Perhaps a customer manager. Good, okay. So this person is looking for uh, a customer services management role, probably in food retail, yeah? So they don't say it's not, as specific as this one as a clinical practice assistant 
but they say they want to use management skills and that they have experience in food retail. The job they want is in food retail customer services management. And what about the last one? SEO position fashion industry. Ah, okay. Oh, I think I made a mistake in my slides. Sorry. <laughs> but if we look here, why is it fashion industry? Marketing executive looking for a search engine optimization position where well, I can apply my 15 years of experience in the fashion industry and use my SEO skills to increase sites traffic. So they want a SEO position and they mention their fashion industry experience. So we know that they are looking for a job in the fashion industry. If this person wanted a job in food industry or in the art industry, this would not be useful. It's not useful because it's not relevant. If you want a job in the fashion industry, it is useful and it is relevant. So it's good. OK. So let's have a look at a template. OK. This is just an example template that you could use for your profile. I have used this template to write a profile for myself and I want you to have a go to write it for yourself. To write this profile, we need to think, first of all, of a job title that matches your career. For me, it's an English teacher. For you, you might need to think of a general term that isn't your specific job title at the moment. For example, if you work in project management and you are an associate project management lead, you have a very long, strange job title. Then you want to make it shorter. Project management professional or event management professional. OK. Then we say how much years of experience you have and maybe mention what specific experience is relevant here. We want to mention an achievement, a qualification or a prize. And we want to mention your current goal. This is the template. I'm going to show you my one and then maybe you can have a go at writing your own. So do take a screenshot of the page if that helps. This is the template so you can keep working on yours and I will read mine. OK. As an English teacher with three years of experience in providing CV guidance and career advice, I have successfully supported students from across the world to prepare for job interviews. Qualified in teaching English online, I am perfectly positioned to teach business English skills to professionals or whatever is important for the job. So here you can see, remember, because English teacher begins with a vowel, I've put an as an English teacher with three years of experience in providing. And then what is my experience that is specific to this class, for example? We then say I have successfully. And remember that this is in the present perfect. So I have successfully supported students from across the world to blah, blah, blah. Then we mention the qualification qualified in teaching English online. I am perfectly positioned to. And then my current goal. So what can you write about yours? If you need to. Um, If you need to change this, so you might want to change it from I am perfectly positioned. You might want to say I am currently seeking a role as a manager or I'm currently seeking a role in in London or in Manchester or in Madrid. I am currently looking for a position as a customer services assistant. I am currently looking for a position as a lawyer. If you don't know what to put here, maybe you, your qualifications, you might say instead of qualified in, you might say um, I have a PhD with a PhD in business management, with a PhD in business management or with uh, training in health and safety or whatever. You can you can add the specifics um, here. 
if you didn't have a prize. <laughs> Sometimes people get prizes, so you might have won an award or you might have been published if you do writing, but you can just use a qualification if not. So your homework, I would really like you to take a, a screenshot or, or take a look at this and try to write your objective. If you want to put it in the box, I'll check for the next few minutes to see if anybody writes them um, and see if you can choose a good achievement and a good qualification uh, and put it into your CV. That is your homework for today. Um, okay, I'm going to go off now. So do take a screenshot if it's helpful. And then I'm going to, oh, if I can, can I escape? Great. Okay. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I hope it was useful. Please do put your comments in. Um, my next class is at the same time on Friday and we will be doing small talk um, or the type of conversations you have at the beginning of an interview before the interview starts. Um, but of course, there are lessons all day uh, on italki. So please tune in. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you for coming.